Hey, we're going again with Charlie Taylor, my friend Charlie Taylor. Thank you so much for coming down, brother. You're very welcome. Yeah, man. It's nice to be here. It's awesome. Yeah. Awesome to have you. No, I, I was excited. Uh, we've been waiting, what, all summer? Oh, yeah. Uh, 100%. Can't you tell? Uh, yeah, you can. You've been at the cottage. You can tell. How could you tell? <laughs> <laughs> There's some growth. Uh, yeah. Uh, how do you say, you know, you spent the entire summer at the cottage without actually saying it? You know? <laughs> I like it. Looks I like good, it. man. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah, chicks dig it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've been trying to grow one of those for years, you know. Yeah, me too. Well, I'm not going to say anything. <laughs> That's so awesome. Hey, oh. listen, for the uh, benefit of the listeners and the watchers, tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do for, for a living and why you're here today because, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just excited. Well, first of all, I'm here because I'm your friend. Copy that. You and I have worked together in the film industry for, I don't even want to say how yeah, long because it gives, it gives away our <laughs> age, yes. We won't be hot <laughs> anymore. <laughs> yeah, my position really is called a master armor. Yep. I'm the guy that looks after all the firearms and weapons on a movie set. Right so, on. Yeah, doing it for a long time. Yeah. What's your company called? Movie Armaments Group. And you're based out of? Toronto and Mississauga. Wicked. Yeah. And you also have a props company. Yeah. The Prop Studio. And um, Movie Armaments Group has a uh, build shop in, in our shop in Mississauga where we build, you know, all the rubber stunt props and various and sundry other things for the prop departments and sets and what, what have you. Right on. Wow, I didn't know that. That's cool. Yeah, it's cool. I mean, it's easier to build your own rubber guns to your own specifications and to the stunts departments and whatever, build them yourself than to, you know, farm out the work where it costs three times the cost and if you just do it yourself. Right on. Yeah. How long have you been doing that? Oh, I've been making props for myself, rubber guns for myself, since I started. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. But uh, mostly, uh, you know, when you're busy on set, you don't have time to do that. So we decided to hire some really good people, mold makers and whatever, and it's just going gangbusters. That's fabulous. Well, you obviously have an extremely successful business. Just, it's insane. Yeah. Well, you know, honestly, since the first time I started, and you know, going back to, you know, back when I left in high school in 1970, and I was like, oh, what do I want to do for my life, right? You know, for, I th thought maybe I'd join the military or be a cop or whatever, and I ended up being a tool and die maker apprentice. And back then, if you had asked me, you know, would you like to be a film armor? I probably would have said, what's that? Yeah. <laughs> what is that? is that? Is that a thing? Were you into guns back then? Uh, hunting. Like hunting. Okay, like cool. Hunting and stuff, yeah. you know. And it, it all started by me working on my own guns and then visiting a gunsmith. And he would say to me, who did that work? I did. Did it in my own shop, machine shop. So, hey, you want a part-time job? So then I started doing, you know, guns part-time in a gun shop. And then I started doing refinishing of guns. And then I started, you know, getting so busy fixing guns for other people while being a tool maker and meeting the famous John Frenchie Berger, oh, right doing on. guns for him and Shout my now business John. partner, God bless him. Mr. Cornblum. And um, <clears throat> at the end of all of that, you know, I decided that I was making more money doing guns than I ever was doing being a tool maker. And I didn't really like the tool making thing because of a dirty, nasty, you know, sure. jo job at the time. Right. You know, it's, it's changed uh, immensely. But what it did, it brought all that machining capabilities and technical abilities to the forefront of being a gun guy. So then I decided to open my own gun store. So we're talking like 89, 90 through to 91, and it went all the way through to 93 after the new gun laws came in, and it just... The gun laws basically killed us. Yeah, but so like you started a store, like an actual store, store where people yeah. walk in, Taylor's, retail, they purchase yeah. handguns, rifles, yeah. whatever. Taylor's okay. Technical Gunsmithing. I was a Smith & Wesson Warning Center. I was an armor for five different uh, police agencies. And uh, at the same time, while I was doing that, I was still building and doing guns for like Frenchie and other people. But I wasn't actually on set doing stuff. Okay. So it wasn't until after the gun shop closed and i went back to just doing guns on my own at home um i got the call and said hey how would you like to uh do this black powder movie and i don't know the year was 1994 and um and it was it's funny enough the name of the film was called pathfinder okay okay yeah it's like interesting how to find your path yeah no like that's that's pathfinder. how ironic yeah it is and uh it was great it was hard it was all black powder raining niagara gorge 
it was it was horrific really trying to do it with two guys should have had five guys but we did it with with two and then after that i thought wow i made more money in one day than i've made in a week so that was it i started working with frenchy for a while and then went on my own and uh then i did the uh famous romeo and juliet i got asked to build the guns for that show in the fall of 95 so i built those guns and i flew to mexico which was actually pretty funny because they said to me, do you have a passport? And I said, what for? Well, you know you're going to Mexico, right? I'm like, no, I thought I was only building the guns. I had no idea I was going to be the uh, armorer on the show. Whoa. <clears throat> yeah, no, seriously. So I had to go get a passport, take a video of the guns, get on a plane, fly to Mexico. I'd never been anywhere in my life, so scared shitless, you know? <laughs> so I go down there, and it's like, hey, this is great. It was at uh, Studios Churubusco. Met the director, Baz Luhrmann, and all the crew. I thought, oh, this is pretty cool. Flew, flew back home and then tried to get all the guns into Mexico. Which, just a second. Wasn't, didn't Baz Luhrmann just do that Elvis movie? I don't know. I don't know I, what I, he's I, done I, last, but okay. he's, he just did another sure. picture. I'm not sure exactly which one. But I'll tell you, it was the best experience in my life. Although I'd been on set before, being out of the country, working on a show with new people, with crew from around the world, all working in one place. I show up on set for the very first day. I was working with the uh, prop master, uh, Mark Corval, and uh, we had a great relationship at that time. And I was just allowed to do and be, you know, what I think I, I, I do best. And I saw a lot of things on other sets and uh, stories about how things should and shouldn't be done. And I developed my own way of doing things. Like the first time I said, you know, <clears throat> guns are hot. I don't know. L.A. guy said, what? Oh, wow. You know? Seriously? No, no, seriously, because everybody wants to know when you're going to do gunfire. Because there's always that there's always that one person that doesn't know. And yeah, it's not a nice surprise right. to be standing there and it goes off. So, so back then, I was develop, developing my own protocols of what I like to do because, you know, frankly, most people on a movie set don't like guns. They, yeah. just, they just don't. And that show was no exception. There's a lot of people that didn't like guns. But then, you know, I'm dealing with some teenagers down there and younger people who treated them a little lax and uh, they got talked to by me and uh, I was told a couple times that I was a little tough on them mm. but they appreciated it after because everybody got a chance to go home yeah and just imagine you take Claire Dane and she's going to take a handgun a loaded handgun and put it to her head and fake like she's going to kill herself and the parents were there and she's she's young yeah and how do you talk a parent through allowing their daughter to put a loaded gun to their head you know, gun wasn't loaded, but I'm just saying right. the, the, th the thing. And anyway, so she did it. Um, all the actors were, were great. We had a great time. And that was my first real initiation to be an onset, full-time armor, you know. And I imagine that it's changed immensely. Obviously, you've probably continued to add some of these rules as time went on. As a matter of fact, yeah. I mean, we, we, <clears throat> we started, you know, I would say things really started to change a lot in 97, I did the show Once a Thief, okay. and that was like main and second unit, crazy, <clears throat> crazy, gunfire every day or almost every day, second unit, having a couple of guys, and I had to hire people that had firearms experience, but not necessarily set experience. So I decided just for myself and as a company to bring the people on uh, that have years of experience, both military, law enforcement, and firearms people that have been around guns, and say, this will be our team. We're not going to have anybody that doesn't know anything. We're not going to need to train them as far as how to handle a gun. We just need to train them set etiquette, like right. how, how to deal with people. Because as you know, there are a lot of... Yeah, there's different personalities that we have to navigate yeah, every that's day. A, that's a very polite way of saying personalities. Yeah. Yes. Some, some people you can't, <laughs> you can't look at. You, know, you, you can't even talk to them when you handle the gun. You just have to look down at the floor because they're in the oh moment. You know, yeah, okay. it's, it's one of those things. But, you know, we've navigated our way through that. In doing so, in Canada, back in, uh, I think the year was 2000, the government passed a rule uh, because uh, my business partner and I, we both had these separate permits that were given to us by the Solicitor General of the Province of Ontario that said that Section 93.1 of the Criminal Code, which is the possession of prohibited weapons and devices, does not apply to you. So basically, you can have whatever you like. Copy. Wow. So that went on for a while, but after 2000, they were like, yeah, no, that's not going to happen. 
that's not going to fly. The new law is coming out and they're all going to be called prescribed purposes now. So you're going to get the special license, you know. So we went through that whole process of go, uh, me personally going to Ottawa, being invited by the government to sit down at a table with other industry professionals and talk about what exactly does the film industry need. Because before, any machine gun or prohibited weapon you brought into the country, you had to send it back out. So how does that work? Okay. You know, you know it's very hard to do anything. Like having an, a machine gun or an AR or something like that in the film industry back in the 80s and very early 90s, they were hard to get because you couldn't get them into the country. And if you had got them in the country, you had to send them back. So with the new change in regulations that we helped institute, it's now you can have whatever you like as long as it's for the film industry it's safe, you know, safely stored, you know. Sure. How of many course. of them are you, are there of you uh, in Canada that have that? Uh... You know, I don't know specifically how many, <clears throat> like, guys have the license, uh, but I don't know too many that have the licenses that I have. I have three of them. One is, you know, wholesale retail, gunsmithing that, and selling. Then the other one is film and television supply. And then another one is government manufacturing so I can do everything from manufacture firearms, import, export, to supply to the film industry, and do wholesale retail, firearms and ammunition, and prohibited weapons and devices. So there's three separate. Um, they used to be on one, but that made the RCMP nervous. Right. Because they don't, there we've done it again. We've given that guy the license that says 93.1 doesn't apply to you. So, yeah, so they s separate into three separate licenses. Uh, which has made it challenging for us and for them, for the, the CFO and the OPP to, you know, come and police us. And they're more more about compliance than enforcement, you know. Right. Because they, they learned through the whole, through the 90s, they learned stuff. Look, I had many meetings with them. They're saying, no, 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 you can't do that. And I said, well, the law says I can. And we had, you know, butting heads, but it ended up having uh, meetings with the Solicitor General's office and then, you know, having an officer call you one day and say, hey, Charlie, it's Tom. Um, I don't know who you know, but some laser-guided shit came down through our office this morning and we were ordered to issue you your permit. And it's because we have a legitimate purpose. We have a film industry. Absolutely. I mean, I, I can't tell you how many billions of dollars it is now, right? Even back then, it was, it was pretty big, even in the early 90s. Uh, there, there was a lot of shows going on and guns were going crazy. In the city here, there was maybe two or three of us that were doing it. And across the country now, there's maybe three or four top companies. Right. And uh, we're one of the biggest, or if, <clears throat> if not the biggest, just in volume of, of stuff. And uh, as a lot of people don't know, we don't just do the film industry, right? We, we do military uh, foreign weapons training where my staff... Guys like Adam, you met before. Yeah, of course. They would go off to a military. You got you have great guys working for you. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I, Adam I am, was here. Yeah, I yep. am. Yeah, I am so blessed with all the guys because they bring so much of their own personal history, and some have been deployed in war zones. Um, you know, some guys officers for over thirty years. And yeah, tactical and kicking doors down and whatever. And who better to be on like the set of Mayor of Kingstown than have a half a dozen guys on your crew that are all cops. Uh, absolutely. Put plenty of those guys in there. Man, it yeah, was man, awesome. You know. <laughs> My SWAT team on that show was incredible. Yeah, it yeah. was wicked. Yeah, and you know something? That's the part of what we do I really like. When the stunt coordinator, the producers, the director, everybody's on the same page where we really want to make the cast like the SWAT team, uh, Robert's team, yeah. and do the training. It doesn't happen all the time, as you well know. Absolutely. Um, and I think, it's, I think it's sad that it doesn't happen, but generally it's budget. Stuff. Yeah, it and is, it, and it just is what it is. But when you get a chance to do that, you take what you know and you you put it on to the actors and like yourself, and just say, "Here's how you do it," and you know, you guys are going to look awesome on uh, on set, and uh, that actually comes about. Yeah. I'm going to take with me that training and everything off the top, and working with those guys with me everywhere I go now, and it's incredible. Yeah, it's it's one of those things. You yeah, never... and he's also made some very lifelong friends now because of that. Yeah, I just had uh, I just had steak with Sean the other day. Yeah, you know, the, the guys are great. I mean, yeah. Sean, incident commander for you know Toronto ETF. I totally. Mean, like, where do you find a guy like that? Yeah, he I, was here too. He's incredible. You know, <laughs> and, and like you get these guys that that work with you and for you, 
Um, now, like all the guys, like one of my guys, Paul Wassel, you know, oh, I love Durham, Paul. Paul, Durham amazing. Tech, you know, did nuclear defense force and all the stuff, officer, sergeant, you know, and then Larry Wheatley, the bomb squad and, yep. you know, and all the other guys. Uh, we had Mike Babineau. Um, we haven't seen him much these years, but, you know, he was a, a team leader. So when he was working for us and Jimmy Bremner and guys, uh, you know, haven't been out in a while, but, you know, from the, from the first days when an ETF guy came on the film set and met us, let's say, hey, listen, if you're interested, when you retire or you're looking for a part-time job, I'm looking for people. Right on. And at first it was, you know, the bosses didn't think it was cool having an active duty police officer working on the same set, being a gun guy, being policed by another active duty police officer. As a pay duty there. At, yeah. So it was like a conflict of interest. So they, some of them helped out and then some of them didn't help out until they retired. Right. And it was great. You know, bring them on board because I really don't have to train them a lot uh, about, you know, how the film sets work, you know, because some guys like to come and talk. Then you first, you know, next thing you have the first AD screaming, who's talking? <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> it's the gun guys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but honestly, I think the, um, we've had some days with our guys that are kind of like, uh, uh, God, it's, it's tough and whatever. And I look at them and say, are you kidding me? This is the easiest job in the world. We get to come here, hang out with the stunt guys, hang out with the actors, drink coffee. Guns are hot. Guns are safe. Shoot some shit, blow some shit up and go home. Like, oh, sounds cool. like a good day to like, me. It like, sounds like a cool <laughs> job, right? Mm -hmm. Right. And I'm serious. It's, yeah. It's, it's, it's the greatest job in the world. It's not easy. You know, it's, it's never been easy. Some of the early days were pretty tough sleeping in my truck, mm. you know, did a lot of that going me too. to park. Where's the, where's, where, where's set tomorrow? Oh, it's just down the street. Great. Can I park there? <laughs> you know, pull the truck in, get in the, in the cot and sleep. We've all done it, man. Yep. Yeah. And that's why we are where we are today. Yeah. You know. So it's been, it's been great. How'd you meet Frenchie? Frenchie came into my store one day. Okay. Yeah. I knew of him. Yeah. And I'd go to the gun shows and he'd be there with the, uh, all the other Al Hobbs gunsmith who was, uh, Al Hobbs was the guy I worked with. And okay. He taught me a lot of stuff and I was gunsmithing with him and mostly uh, refinishing and rebluing guns for him. And through him, I met all these guys in his place, including my current partner, Richard. And uh, it's just you know made friends with them and did a lot of stuff for them like back then people were handing me machine guns that were torch cut with a torch and said hey can you uh put that back together and i can and i did and that's how we had to make machine guns back then not anymore now we just go buy them right and uh, it was interesting i uh, was talking to the guys down in los angeles in the post rust incident about, oh we're gonna get to that aren't uh, about um you know accessing guns and some of the guys flew up here to look at other business prospects and as such and we talked about our licensing here versus their licensing and you know when the first guy said to me i was in a shot show in vegas he goes so how many ak's do you have and i said i don't know like 400 or something and their <laughs> eyes just about bugged out of their head and i said it was because of what i mentioned earlier because we went to the government and said here this is what we need we don't want you limiting us to say oh you can only have six right because, I mean, I did a movie in, in um, Morocco called Path to 9-11, and I had 350 people with guns. Wow. All firing. And, wow. And that was a show where production only allowed me to have four people, four armors. For 350 firearms. Yes. Path to 9-11. Yeah, the Harvey Keitel. I don't think I'd ever, I never saw it. but Interesting, though. But that, that was a show, and we had camera people from here, and the production was here. And when I got there and I hired two guys from the UK, I had to go to the French stunt coordinator and say, I need your help. I need you guys to be team leaders doing your stunts and whatever. So it worked out that I had guys I could trust. Like as if I said to Randy or you, oh, you know, I, I need, I need you guys to uh, take care of these few guys prior to the stunt, make sure they're hot and everything's safe. And then we'll come back, sweep through and make sure everything's safe when we all cut. Otherwise, you know, couldn't we, be done. We had Al Verklin way across the other set, 200 meters away with like, I don't know, 60 guys with machine guns and French stunt guys all driving vehicles and riding horses and doing stuff. Just pandemonium. And um, that was the day I was like, yeah, 
guess what? We're not doing that again. <laughs> We're just not doing that again. Remember I talked to you earlier about um, learning. Yeah. Yeah. It's been, yeah, we're not doing that again. Yeah. And there was one famous scene where we have this fellow. He's an older gentleman. He's an amputee. And they had him with a prosthetic leg. And there's a bomb that goes off right in front of my station. Guns firing. Horses whipping around. The Taliban come in. And uh, the director is screaming at something. I can't hear him from all over, over all the gunfire. And I hear him saying something. And it's telling the Taliban stunt guys to grab the other stunt guys on the ground and lift them up by their hair and shoot them in the back of the head with an AK. And when I watched the first guy do it, my eyes opened up and I started screaming, like, don't, don't, don't. But the thing that the, the director was yelling was, shoot the amputee, shoot the amputee. I, I didn't know what he was saying because he was screaming it. And I watched the guy walk over to this old guy who was an amputee. And he did it safely, of course. He looked at where a camera was, but he pulled the guy up by his hair, this old, Jeez. seriously old guy, and <laughs> shot him like his, an off, off camera shot, like he shot him in the back of the head. <clears throat> but somebody made t shirts, shoot the amputee. Oh, no. You know, and after, after, <laughs> oh, wow. they, after they yelled cut, <laughs> I went in and I was screaming. I was screaming at everybody. It's like, what the hell was that? We're not doing that again, or I'm putting all the guns away and we're going home. And that's the part about the early days of filmmaking. It was like, I don't know. And learning. Guerrilla filmmaking, maybe. Yeah. Where you're the last guy to know what we're actually doing. You ever yeah. been there? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And you can't do that yeah. anymore. You know, and now it's big changes. And, you know, the rust incident just brings that home full force. Let's talk about that. Sure. Um, what the fuck? Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, no, yeah, hey, yeah let's, no, like, absolutely. What the fuck? Yeah, we, every, WT, everyone yeah. has their opinions. And the moment it came across the news, um, I was sitting with my wife and she said, how could that happen? I, I remember it clearly. I said, well, they're in New Mexico. Someone was out at lunch planking bottles off of a fence. And that's sort of what happened. Am I right? No. I love that. I okay. love an education. Sure, I love I love correcting him. So now I'm I'm excited for you to do it. You sir, are wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I got the phone call within hours of it happening from yeah. other armors. Hey Charlie, do you know anything? And I said, I'm in Canada. You guys are in LA. I figured you guys would know more than me. Then the phones were ringing off the hook. So next thing, it's you know, news agencies calling CTV, CP24. So I immediately jump on to with CTV and CP24 um live interview and they asked me so what do you think and i said well you know i don't want to um guess and make a mistake and accuse people or anything but i'm going to tell you something that with the rules and regulations that we have here in this country and the way we handle guns on set there is no way that would ever happen here no way it's not possible it's i've just, never even seen it it's just not going to happen but i will tell you this there's only two ways that that could happen. One, there was live ammunition on set. Okay. Number two, the armorer wasn't there. And they're like, what do you mean? I said, the armorer wasn't right there. Wasn't present. Okay. And <clears throat> as it turns out, uh, the armorer is the daughter of the famous Thel Reed. Right. And, you know, a gun guy the gun guy of gun guys, Mr. Western, right? He's been around for years, done hundreds of movies and a little bit of a loose cannon sometimes, but a really nice guy, solid, knows what he's doing. He's good at what he's doing. And his young daughter is jumping into this. Second movie. Yeah. So then as soon as I heard that the armor was not allowed to be in during the rehearsal because of COVID rules, I'm like, yeah. Oh, I'm gonna wow. Tell, I'm going to tell you something. Today, I don't care if we have Ebola. I didn't that see that coming, though. That guns are not going to set without me. You guys can you guys can have rubbers or something, or rehearse with your fingers or something. So if, if I'm putting a live gun there, empty or not, I'm there. And if you can't, same with doing a scene where people don't have their clothes on. I've had, <laughs> I've had a show where the first AD's looking at me, and the lady's getting, she's in bed, and the guy's in bed. I mean, there's the... the Pillows are being stitched by gunfire. Two bad guys are coming in with submachine gun. The girl rolls off the bed naked, grabs the gun, and shoots back. And the first AD looks at me and says, you, out. And I'm like, okay. I left the room. 
Charlie, get back in here. <laughs> we need the guns. I said, yeah, I know. Yeah, totally. No, no, They're, absolutely. It's like, you, you know, don't tell the stunt coordinator to go away when he needs to have eyes on the what's stunt. going on. Yeah. So that incident is no different. They, you stay outside. Um, and you, well, okay, I'll stay outside. And just take a gun off the table. What the final report says, they found 150 live rounds, either on the prop truck, in the kit, and whatever. 150. So we know from the police report that they had gone and done some training days before where Thel Reed, the father, supplied the ammunition. They went out, trained the actors, shot live ammo, blah, blah, blah. Somehow, some way, that live ammunition ended up on the cart or in the box or somewhere in the set area. And all it takes is somebody to assume that one of those is a dummy round. Then you have this. What is happened. that what happened? Like That's exactly what happened. So the dummy rounds, put them in the gun. And apparently, if I remember correctly, you have to correct me if I'm wrong, but I think there was only one live round in that gun. The rest were dummies. And I know the guy who supplied the dummy rounds, and I know the manufacturer that makes them, same guy that makes them for me. You know, they're a cartridge with no primer, no gunpowder, just a bullet and a BB inside. So you, so can, you can shake it. You can here. shake it and rattle and you can know. Mm -hmm. And um, there are just things that happen that should never have happened. You can blame Alec Baldwin all you want as the actor, the person on the floor in front of the camera. But in, in that instance, when the person he trusts, the first AD, and the first AD trusting the armorer, um, and he puts a gun in hand, so the gun's cold. Or guns are safe and puts it and he goes, does this thing. What's in his mind? This gun's safe. I'm gonna I'm gonna act now. And boom, the Total. gun like boom, the gun goes off. From that perspective, I feel bad for everybody. And I feel especially bad, sick to my stomach, that somebody had to lose their life in a tragic way and somebody else get wounded. Mm -hmm. It's so not necessary. And when we do what we do, and all the armors that we know are like, oh God, not again. It's got to be, it's got to be something. It's got to be somebody who doesn't know what they're doing or nobody's following the rules. And a lot of guys in the States kept their mouth shut, the armors, because they don't want to get sued by people by saying things, you know, could have been this, could have been that. I, I'm a little bit different that way. I say, here's the rules that I go by. I don't know what the rules are there, but here's the rules that I go by, by and there's no way that would ever happen here. It's just not possible. And when you finally see the final report, they call it an accident. And it is an accident. An accident propagated by stupidity. You know, I said it on um, CBS Nightline one night. And they said, do you have any final words when I heard some of the stuff? I said, this is the perfect storm of stupid. Just stupid. You know, we've all been around on the movie sets where, oh, why do you need so many gun handlers? Or, you know, do you really need to have an hour pre-call or... You know, all these little things to save money. And when you come to the stunt guys who are shooting a car off the ramp and the effects guys doing something with cables and whatever, don't ask stupid questions about why we need to be there at these times because we need time to set it up. We need time to rehearse and all this stuff. And if you don't, this is the kind of stuff that happens. I've been around long enough to see a lot of things. There's a lot of close calls, mostly for the stunt guys and effects. Almost no cl close calls for accidents, like for, for gun stuff. Some actors that just didn't do as they were told, mm -hmm. you know, shoot here, A, B, C, D, and uh, make sure your gun is pointed here, here, and here, and you're going to shoot two shots here and one shot here and one shot there. The stunt guy's going to do this or whatever, rehearse, rehearse, rehearse. We do it, and they do exactly the opposite, which happened in North Bay with another yeah, yeah. Put, right. the, put the gun under chin. Yeah, yeah. Like, we all know that you, one. You say, hey, we're going to do this. Yeah, okay, yeah, we do it twice, and then, you know, okay, take three, and he does something completely different, like the, you know, I used to call them brain farts. Like. But that's as easy as the director saying, oh, can we just do this uh, in a personal Yeah, just world, between the two of them. And, and then they don't, they, yeah, and the actor doesn't yeah. know enough to comply with everything you, when it comes to guns. Yeah. You and, know? And that actually happened on Suicide Squad. Yeah, big movie, lots of gunfire. Uh, David Ayer, super guy, you know, sub submariner dude, lots of experience with guns, knows us, likes us. We all got together along. We have 
some former Navy SEALs there and um, uh, Australian SAS guys actually in the, the stunt crew actors. And it all went really well. And then the first AD walks up to one of the cast members and said, oh, I want you to do this. So you're going to do a sweeping shot left of camera, fire two shots. Sweep to the camera, fire two shots. And the cameras, but that's after we've done it like four times. It's going to want you to do this. So what does the actor do? And I won't mention his name. Um, he sweeps through the camera, right across the lens, at three feet away, firing full loads all the way. Brr. And the camera guys freaked out. And we're all standing over there with our mouth open, like, what the hell? And it, but it happened. And he's like, how do you, how do you mitigate that happening? And I've always said that if an actor wants to take a loaded gun and stick it in his ear and pull the trigger on set, there's little or nothing anybody can do about it. It's, it's, it's kind of like, <gasps> right? Yeah. And it's over. Hmm. What we try to do is create a, an atmosphere where they're, I don't want to use the word afraid, but respectful of doing exactly what they're told. And I don't, it doesn't matter if it's Bruce Willis or, you know, Arnold Schwartz. It doesn't matter. It's like, you will do this, this, and this, and this. And 99.99% of all, and they're like, okay, sure. Yep. Got it. Stunt coordinators in there, fight coordinators in there. The stunt guys are in there. Everybody's working this huge choreography of action. And when somebody decides to do something different, you need to like put your hand up. Say, hey, I'd like to do this. Don't just do it without telling anybody. Yeah, actors will uh, say they're in the moment. And this is a decision they made in the moment. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I had an incident many years ago where it was, I was actually on Once a Thief where this uh, young girl was, we had to take her training and she had to fire an M16 and a handgun. And when we took her to the range, she cried because the sound and the concussion hurt her feelings. And I understand that from somebody who's absolutely petrified. She was shaking like a leaf, but trying to get her to get through it, do the training. And by the time we were done, she was like, can I get some more ammo? <laughs> I was like, no, you're good. You're good. Huh. This we're going to we're going to rehearse what you're going to do that day and all she had to do in this fight she's in a sequence where there's an, an ice cake and whatever at some family function and she starts shooting and we didn't trust her with a semi-automatic so we gave her an old western single action revolver so she had to cock it every time and she had to turn around 180 degrees and and shoot at the ice cake and blow up the cake or the ice uh, statue so instead of turning around, she put the gun over her shoulder, her left shoulder, Ooh. pulled the trigger as one of the stunt guys was just going by. Oh. And he got it. He didn't get it in the side of the head, but he got it beside, behind his head, a full load, 45 long Colt. And yeah. he hit the ground. Oh, he's wearing, everybody's wearing ear protection, whatever. But it stunned him because it scared him because he didn't expect it. And I just yelled, cut, and walked in and took the gun from her and actually said, what the hell was that? She started crying. And, you know, she had to leave the set crying and the stunt guy's on the ground. She's and embarrassed. You okay? Of course she's embarrassed, but she could have killed somebody. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And we had this other show where this young fellow, um, he was, say, say he's 12 years old, and he has a gun and he has to shoot this, this old Western revolver. So we set it up. His parents were there and it was just all he had to do is lift the gun and shoot. So the gun is loaded. Al Berkland, who was working with me, was the mm -hmm. armor. And this kid had this cow lick, so the gun is loaded and the gun's hot, and he's, he cocks it back, and he's ready, and action. And then his cow lick falls in front of his face, and he takes the barrel of the gun and flicks his hair back. Oh. Al was on that gun just as the barrel passed his hair and grabbed it and pulled it down and screamed at him and used some colorful language at the same time. Al's a great guy. It's awesome. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> that was my first guy. Yeah, you know, he's awesome. Long, yeah, long yeah. Time. And, uh, you know, a lot of people were upset at the language and, uh, you know, yeah. the stuff that happened. But at the end of the day, he could have killed himself. Wow. Could have killed himself, but he yeah. didn't because my armors were right there. Made sure it didn't happen. And it's happened a lot where something's about to happen. You see, in a sequence where I was there, a swimming pool, scantily dressed, people actresses in the pool uh the stunt guys have the air mattresses that they're all floating on tied down to the bottom with weights so they don't move and there's a choreographed gunfight 
there. And so where all the shell casings are going, they're going to land in certain parts of the pool and nobody's going to get burnt with a case. The shot starts and it was a stunt man director and the action starts and I'm watching, watching and I see the uh, lead rope come untied. She starts floating into the zone where all the casings are going to be from the AK-47. So I walk in and say, cut, 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 cut. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And I hear the scream from the tent. Who the F yelled cut? And I said, I did, sir, sorry. And uh, Keith Murphy, the camera operator, yeah. was there. Great goes, guy, what, another good guy. What, yeah. what, what happened? And I said, oh, she's untied. And uh, the stunt guy jumped in the pool, tied her back up, and said, okay, we'll load, go again. And the, the director was frothing because the shot was so good up to that point. But yep. the safety, nope. safety of, first, man. Safety first. So I backed up. And it was dead silence because he was still grumbling in the tent that I called cut. And because he felt like this is my show. I'm the one supposed to yell cut. But anyways, yeah. I yelled cut anyways. And then when we did it again, there was shell casings like rain all around her, but not on her position. And it's funny. I think that girl ended up being his wife. Hmm. <laughs> but, oh, is that right? Yeah. Yeah. But it was just one of those things that you go on set and you say, hey, Randy Butcher says you can't be here. Right. Well, guess what? I'm not going to be there. Right, and totally. gu- and guns are the same. It's interesting 100%. that it's a stunt guy that would jump on that. Like I get it that he's directing and that he loved his shot up to that point, but he should have. Come, he's come from a, a world where safety first is, you know, w- what we do, and then he jumps on you for calling the cut. Well, I think it's more because you know he's staring in the monitor <clears> and he sees that it is oh this is this going to be awesome, and he's in that moment, and that's the problem I find with stuff i've had john moore uh the director who used very colorful language with me about why i yelled cut on a shot and and, and he's 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 screaming profanity about oh the f yelled cut and what the hell this is my f you know whatever and i'm like it's me it's charlie hey listen this is what blah 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 give me two seconds i'll fix it we're good oh okay oh okay charlie you know, yeah, yeah, I imagine it's just a bummer losing your shot. Yep. That's yeah. all it is. Yeah, but it, there's we, nothing that would piss you off more, but, but we get I, to do it again. But I have to say I, yeah. something. Yeah. I have to say something. Is that in all my career, the thing that bothers me the most is we wait to the 14th to the 16th hour to blow shit up, of course. to do the big shots. Everybody's tired, including the stunt people, whatever. True. Because they've tried to put too much into one day. I mean, I understand it from a producer standpoint, money standpoint actor availability standpoint and you try to put all choreograph that all together into a day where you know it's it, we have to get it in that time but i look at it this way with what i do um uh an emergency you know like i any any uh, piss poor planning in the in the planning stage is gonna cause a problem you know and for you guys to say, well, we're losing the light. We only got four hours left or we, you know, we got to get this shot before lunch or everybody's going to meal penalty. I, my personal opinion is like, I don't care. We're going to do this safely and we can't do it safely. Then guess what? We're not doing it. You can fire me if you want, but I'd like to go home. Everybody likes to go home. And I know, you know, at the end of the day, somebody's going to get shit for spending more money than we should have. But at the end of the day, everybody wants to go home. Yes, we want to get the shot. We all want to do it. And there has been a lot of give and take with the act, the the unions. Mm-hmm. They say, "Yeah, okay, let's get it done. Let's just get it done, and then we'll we'll do the hour lunch." But where they do it says, "Well, let's get it done," and then they go, "Oh yeah, it's a half hour pay through, where people are eating their lunch on set, rushing to go on to the rest of the day. Everybody's tired, miserable, bitching, and whatever. And then we're going to do something big. That's the part about the film industry that always bugged me." still today bugs me yeah uh, i guess yeah i mean that that makes so much sense no i'm just sitting here living it so, <laughs> yeah yeah as you say it i've got so many memories of that exact same thing randy butcher was time. never there <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no that's you know totally yeah um they usually wait till the end of the day before they do a big stunt you know and a lot of times we're we sitting around to. people are tired and Mm. it's just silly yeah the one thing that i found on one show i won't say who it is but uh because it, it, if i was the producer i would be embarrassed to hear this so they come to me and say hey charlie why do you need eight guys here today and i said excuse me it's, it's in my budget i need eight armors today because i need an armor at the tent 
because we have, I don't know, 45 machine guns going, and we're on a set that's probably 600 feet long, and we got a group of guys at one end and another group of guys at the other end. There's belt-fed machine guns. There's actors that are carrying two or three guns, and they're all firing. And there's Was I on that show? I don't know. It's a, it's a suicide squad. And uh, oh. <laughs> a, 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 anyways, so I'm like, well, here's why. And I, and I feel sometimes that I constantly have to, you know, say, to, why, why do you need so many people? Why, 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 why? And then I said, well, and they said, you know, we're spending, you know, $160,000 a day or we're wasting this. And, and they said, you know, how do you think we can improve it? I said, well, look at all the cranes you have here that right. haven't moved in days. Camera cranes. You're not even using them. You've got 16 stunt guys in trailers. They've been here all day. They're hair, makeup, whatever, and you're not going to use them. You guys are wrapping them and sending them home. That's because you guys don't have a plan. When we did that show, believe it or not, I was not allowed to read a script. I wasn't given a script. I had no idea what we were doing. All I know, That's the silly. prop master was like, here's the guns. Here's what we want you to bring. Bring everything. Okay. Then the stunt coordinators or the stunt fighters from Australia actually brought me a map of this, what we're going to do. I said, great, because I don't know what we're doing. And, you know, I don't know what we're doing until we're doing it. Just, you know, there's a bunch of those shows, you, you know, bring everything and be prepared to do something. Mm -hmm. That is a recipe for a disaster. But if you have professionals that do it, we can, you know, go on the fly and whatever. But post yeah. rust, nobody asks questions anymore. Now it's like, if there's anything that looks like a gun on set, we want an armor. And the studios have just like 180 degree change. Yep, armor. Yep, yep. We want air, airsoft guns, gas guns, whatever. And even from a policy standpoint from our company, we've had to, you know, from our insurance companies, like, okay, anything that you rent that is capable of firing a projectile, even a BB gun, an armor has to go with it. Hmm. Or you have to rent it in a deactivated state so nobody can use it. Right. Well, I've already been on a few productions that just don't want guns now. Yeah. It's just no guns. And any gun that they do have is either a rubber or a welded yeah. up. Yeah. But prop. we, but we've uh, on uh, untitled productions with Arnold Schwarzenegger. We're doing mm -hmm. gunfire, and on a couple other shows, I have friends that are working in in um, Rome right now and Italy and other countries. They're doing gunfire. Um, we have a studio that we just finished shows. Said no, nope. studio says no. We can do gunfire. We just choose when and how right and um that was uh, the big cigar and uh well, that's still ongoing they're all, they're going down to south america right now but did we do any did we end up doing any gunfire no no they they said yes we wanted to but then you know the shots and we don't because we're shooting shotguns and whatever they're like yeah you know it doesn't work to do gunfire here and i i agree i yeah. saw paul out on that show yeah and he, i mean even he told me that there's uh a lot of questions coming. You know, what are you guys going to do to make things safer? Since Rust. That's what he said. Yeah, and I said nothing. We're not going to do a thing. Yeah, I, I, I imagine it was kind of... Uh, well, that's what you said when you got home. You told me that Paul had asked you that. Yeah, there's yeah. There's nothing else you can do because you do the, you're yeah, the it's best. It's like, well, yeah, the, the the answer is to go with someone like us. Yeah. And, like and, you and he's not wrong. Uh, I mean, when we talked about early before we started about our company policy. We put a policy in place way back when the city of Toronto had the film commission and started doing uh, guidelines with the Ministry of Labor, who was helped set up by a couple of ETF officers, uh, fil uh, film industry experts, stunt people. I think it was Steve Lisescu was involved in that. Uh, Don Carmody, the producer, was involved, plus other union head members to say, okay, what are the guidelines for firearms? What are the guidelines for smoke? What are the guidelines for working at heights and explosions and stunts and cars and all these things? So they have these guidelines, and uh, I think it's guideline 39 or 36 for guns. And I helped modify it a few times um, over the years where I said, yeah, that's actually not right. Let's change that line and make it this. And it's a, it's a very standard basic guideline that basically says what firearms, you know, firearms are consider them always loaded. You know, don't point them at people, you know. That's just incredibly basic. You know, that's the basic stuff. And But w what we do is we take that and we, we put it to a an employee format that say, you will do this. You will do this. Your responsibilities are A, B, C, D, E, F on, on set from packing the guns up in the morning 
to keeping a record of what you take out of the army to make sure it comes back, how much ammunition you use, what you take, that you bring it back. Like even a high capacity magazine is a prohibited weapon or a prohibited device in this country. Right. And if we lost one, you might as well lose a machine gun because it's the same charge. Um, a replica, hmm. rubber gun. Most people don't know this. That you take a rubber gun that doesn't, it looks, copies with near precision a real gun, like from three feet away, you can't tell it's not real. That's a prohibited weapon as well. It's a prohibited replica. And now with the new changes in regulation from the federal government and the banning of assault style weapons, they've added, you know, 15,000 different devices now from uh, grenade launchers, like an old AT4, any tank rocket that the second you fire it, boom, it's an empty tube. There's nothing in it. That tube now is prohibited. Mm. So you can't rent them anymore. It has to go with an armor. A lot of stuff like that. Has it has it affected you with your privileges sort of doing what you do? Nope. Okay. Nope. Beautiful. Because like, like you said, nothing needs to change. I mean, we, we're already policed up the wazoo. <coughs> we have rules and regulations in place for our own staff. There are just certain things we won't do. And here's a classic example. Uh, production called that we're on. Listen, we want some rubber guns to give to our actress so they can have it at their hotel room to whatever. And I said, okay, it can happen, but here's the law, here's the rules. And they're like, oh, okay, never mind. In other words, hmm. have her come to the studio, come to my shop, we'll train her, you know, whether it's a stunt fight, the fight coordinator, us, we'll train her. She, she'll be really good at it. She doesn't have to sit in her hotel room with a gun. She just doesn't. Because that's happened to with other people in the states where there's some guys in his hotel room practicing and somebody mm -hmm. calls the cops because they yeah. see him. So, yeah, but the rules and regulations are so stringent for us, there is no need for us to change a thing. Just keep on doing what we're doing and people respect it because that's the biggest part is uh, Adam, he was here before. He told me that one day he was on set and there's everybody on a film set is a gun expert, including the camera guys, focus pullers, <laughs> first AD, they're all experts. And then Adam, you know, and I've said it too. It's like, well, then why am I here? You guys seem to know what you're doing, so why don't I just go home? And I say it this. Like, you guys should show some respect for the armors because I don't tell the stunt coordinator what to do. I definitely don't tell the camera guy or the focus puller or the lighting guy or the grip or sound or makeup or hair. I don't tell them what to do or how to do their job, but everybody tells the armorer, the gun guy, what they should do, should or shouldn't do. Why are you using a full load on this? Why do we? Why are we doing blanks? Why are we? Do, why? 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 And you're like, well, how about you guys just chill and let us do our job, listen to us, and you know, people say, well, it's it's loud. Yep, guns are loud. That's why they offered uh, ear pro to everybody. Yeah. And if you don't need to be here, <clears throat> like one of the first ads, okay, everybody, if you don't need to be here, outside coking a smoke, you know, if you don't need to be here, don't go. But they always stay. And there's always the one person who comes in from craft service carrying a sandwich and a coffee that has the radio turned off and doesn't know we're going to do gunfire. Then the gunfire starts and they're screaming because they don't have ear protection on. It's always that one person. But if everybody respects everybody's job and we follow the rules and regulations, it's a piece of cake. Look at uh, Mayor of Kingstown as an uh, illustration post-rust. Yep. And we had hundreds of guns and thousands and thousands of rounds. Yep. And not a single incident. Tens of thousands. It was pre-rust, yeah. wasn't it? No, it was post-rust. Yeah. Was it not? Yes. I don't know. I don't... Maybe. Maybe it was kind of overlap. I'm, I'm not, not sure. I'm not into time. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't matter. <laughs> it seemed like five years ago. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. What are we doing now? <laughs> now with CGI, does... Uh, do you think about the future and how this is going to change? Well, it's funny you mention that because I've been working on a project uh, which actually started with another effects house that I asked them pretty quickly when we were doing Resident Evil. I need to put some LEDs and some guns, which we've done a long time ago. And we just, they did it for us and we put the guns there and it worked really well. For a muzzle flash. For a muzzle flash. Oh, wow. But, but, then, but then I looked at it and said, you know, how could we do this differently and make it work? So... I've developed some technology with uh, an electrical engineer and another company and also in conjunction with a camera company. And we're still in the development stage. We have prototypes where the gun itself can fire and cycle, 
no no shell casing. There is an LED in the barrel. There's an LED behind the front sight, and uh, it's all Wi-Fi to a remote box that can set off other LEDs in the room for interactive lighting and tie to a camera so that it only fires when the lens is the, open, the, when, the, when the aperture is open. open. Yeah. The is open. So this has been, and it Whoa. fires, you know, so we've done some tests and it looks pretty good and, uh, you know, took some holidays and now I'm back and Oh, I just found a again. new investment. And um, yeah. we have shows asking for it now that they don't want to do anything but your LED guns. So we've given them some LED guns and they're shooting them now. Uh, but the, the biggest challenge for us was the temperature and color of the LED, brightness, too bright, not enough. Oh, geez, as big a flash, you know, and it's all about lighting. So we developed that technology inside the gun. So I won't go any further than that because it's proprietary. So sure, we're, of course. we're going to go, we're going to continue with that and we're pretty much done. It's just a matter of fit, fitting all that technology in a bunch of different guns. So, you know, just uh, it only fits a Glock. No, you want it to fit every machine gun. A machine gun as well. Yeah. The machine gun's the easy part. They're already built. So that's easy. Um, but... Is that where we're ultimately going to go? I mean, the purist will look at a CGI shots, like some of the action movies, a little bit of John Wick, the last one, where it's like, hmm, yeah. Yeah, you can tell. Yeah. But if the audience doesn't care, who cares, right? Yeah, they're just telling a story. Yeah. So It's all good. It's, it's make-believe. You know, some of the big prop houses in the United States said, you know, their gun fire budgets rental stuff has gone down by 60% or more. But their replica, rubber, and whatever, has gone up by 40%. So I can say, yes, that's happened with us, where we are now renting more deactivated firearms and um, replicas and rubbers than we ever were before. And we do take live guns to set that are, maybe have the firing pin taken at them or something where they're not incapable of firing. But we do everything the same so now we're having more armors going on more sets that normally would have been just a replica because studios insurance companies are like yeah if there's a gun we want an armor i don't care if it's rubber god it's no fun but it's good it's no, no no it's good news. no but it's good it's, it's good news but <laughs> no but, it is, it is. but as we discussed earlier that there are a few pokers in the fire with uh, us as a company and whatever to get involved in uh, producing and helping to produce the old-fashioned, good old drag-out gunfight movies with real gunfire because there are those directors that are still out there that still want to do it, stunt performers that want to do it, producers yeah. that want to do it. They just have to talk insurance companies and cast members and agents and all that stuff to do it. Like, you know, the old, old-fashioned old Hong Kong-style yeah. gun action movie. Absolutely. Yeah. I think the knee-jerk reaction after Rust was to not do any guns, but but then, like I said, we did Mirror of Kingstown with ten with tens of thousands of rounds, yeah. with, without a single incident, and in the right hands, it's incredibly safe in it, using professionals. So, I think people who have no experience or l little experience with guns are frightened. Mm -hmm. That that goes to Canadians, the Canadian laws banning guns i mean they're appeasing to this they're appealing to the same crowd yeah. um the insurance companies of course i mean liability is huge but in the right hands everything's fine i deal with insurance companies once a week on projects that mm. i'm dealing with and uh i don't know i have a history so every once in a while i get some guys that already know me and they just say okay it's you it's good yeah same with us yeah it has to same with the the government with your licensing mm-hmm Somebody has had to, over years, become comfortable with you, and your company, and the way you operate, and that we know this, and there's little pushback. Yeah, that, that is true when it comes to law enforcement. But when it comes to government, especially our current government, when they pass the assault weapons, the uh, assault style weapons ban... Mm -hmm. Um, the public safety minister was asked, well, what about the guys in the movie business? He said, well, they, they can just use rubber guns. That was his... Oh, jeez. And I, I hate using the word ignorant, but, but that's what well, it, it is. Because he has no knowledge of what we do. So what it took was a letter 
from me to the minister and to others to say, hey, here we are. This is what we do. These are the prescribed purposes that we have. And, you know, somebody in their office was like, oh, yeah, we forgot about those guys because they always do. And it just comes to roost like the uh, mass casualty in, um, thing that's going on in Nova Scotia. They call it a mass casualty event instead of calling it what it was. It was domestic terrorism and murder. That's what it was. And the biggest thing that's coming out of that whole thing, and it affects us in the film industry as well as everybody, a firearms owner across the country, is two things. The people who are anti-gun will always use that, the Danforth shooting and other shootings, as, see, guns are bad. We should get them out of the hands of people. Then there's the other side that says, well, hang on a second. The laws here are very stringent, and this particular individual did not follow any of the laws. He broke the law, uh, laws, and as a matter of fact, he was known to police. He's, he's been known problem, no different than the last few days, that horrific stabbing incident. Yeah. You know, these right. are people known to police, criminal, lengthy criminal records, and if you take the same ideology that they're using to ban guns to that event, they would say, well, we just need to ban knives and it'll stop. Or the guy that rode, drove up Young Street and said, we'll just... Ban vans. No, no, we, we can't rent vans to these types of people, right? They think it's going to stop. It's not. Um, but they've always used the anti... I, I hate using that term anti-gun, but that's just the way it is, is people who don't like them, don't want them, don't think we should have them, and that's fine. You can have that opinion. But there are those of us that, and some in this room, who like them, use them in our job. Some people use them for sport, go target shooting. Some people go hunting and whatever. And they're saying, oh, but this gun looks bad. So it looks like a machine gun, but it's not. And it's just all... Um, ignorance. Ignorance and propaganda to try to push... An, an ideological view that we want a, a disarmed population to make people feel safe. They're not any safer because guys like this roam the streets every single day. And a determined enemy, we'll call that person an enemy to society because that's what he was, is an enemy, is that we as a, a citizenry just have to make sure that when people like that pop up, we deal with them. We don't just say, oh, you know, he had a bad life. He's this and that. We'll just leave him alone. No, no, no. If he broke a law, make sure he gets uh, processed through the full extent of the law. But they learn something in this, this whole thing, which is still ongoing, is that it didn't matter whether we had stronger laws in Canada. We have, if we had a complete ban, this guy still illegally imported them. He had them in his possession, illegal possession of ammunition he had a, a replica police car he had a uniform and he had a criminal record or, or at least known to police for his violent tendencies right so what <clears throat> what gun laws that we have or would have had in the future that would have stopped any of it none well that's the same with uh, any gang member yep uh, anywhere. having a firearm anywhere yeah. shooting downtown toronto montreal pick a pick, pick a city uh, it doesn't matter. Well, they're yeah, they're, they're not even starting at the source. The source is that somebody's angry or mental uh, issues. Yeah. Or... Right, but but for the person at home who's not a gun enthusiast, who's frightened of guns, who wishes and dreams that they, they never existed, which you should never inject a dream into an argument. It, it just doesn't happen. You can't say that to me. Um, but people who are afraid of guns, the government, by banning the sale of handguns or banning 1500 assault style weapons is appeasing their fears. Like they're just, they're going, ah, oh, I'm safe now mm -hmm. because no, you're not. No, absolutely. They're not, no. but that's, that's the perception. That's what they think is happening. Well, here's a, here's a classic example. I met some uh, Florida state troopers when I was down in Miami and they, we just happened to be talking about the incidents of highway robberies where uh, these gangs were pulling up on people who were, broken down or they faked being broken down and people would pull over to help them and they would rob them at gunpoint. Mm -hmm. And it was bad. And on, on a lot of the states, especially in Texas and wherever, the same thing was happening. So law enforcement says, well, you know, how do we deal with this? Like, how do we stop this from happening? Well, Florida is a state that has legal gun carry. 
most of the people don't want to carry a gun. I don't, you know, I don't want to be walking around carrying a gun in Toronto. I mean, if I could, I would, but I, I, not necessary for me. If I'm transporting guns and I could carry a gun, I would. But in in Canada, there's no need for us at this moment. You know, as it continues, generally speaking, uh, generally really, speaking, really until, it, true. it's not necessary until it generally starts to get worse. What it's going to, mark my words, it's going to get worse. As long as we are not addressing the true problem, it's going to get worse, not better. But this officer was saying, so we decided, like, what were we going to do? So we set up stings where people were broken on, broken down on the side of the road who were cops and see if these gangsters would come. And they did. And these guys hopped out of their cars with assault rifles and everything and were taking, trying to take the cops down who were posing as broken down on the side of the road. And the SWAT teams are in the bush they pop up and pretty much engage everybody and either sent them home to their mom in a bag or to the hospital and it happened once it's over stopped and everybody yeah. no uh... yep stopped he said stopped hmm. because they knew that the police were on to what they were doing and that whatever they were going to continue to do was going to be bad news for them but now it's gotten worse in the United States, and you can blame the gun culture all you like. But at the end of the day, it's the drug and gang culture that is the problem. Yeah, man. The source is not the gun. That's just the fact. The source is the mind of the person using the gun. Yep. I mean, when you think uh, the young uh, Bison uh, Bisonette uh, fellow here who decided to go to a mosque and shoot some people, right? You have to say to yourself, okay, Take the gun that he used and just put it aside for a second. What does it take for an individual, whether it be Sandy Hook or Uvalde or whatever, what does it take for an individual to go out with a gun or, or a knife like we had a few days ago, run around stabbing people? What does it take? All of us will look at each other and say, you have to be out of your mind. Well, exactly. You have to be out of your mind. We always seem to focus on the tool, mm -hmm. right? Only when it's a gun. If it's a van, a knife, a bat, a stabbing spree or whatever, we don't focus on that. But we do it when it's a gun because it's convenient to say, hey, let's see, we need to get rid of guns. We need to ban guns. Then this thing will not happen. No, that's not true. You can have your, you know, dream weaver ideas that, you know, everything is going to be wonderful and we'll all smoke dope and sing kumbaya and everything will be fine and you, might, and you might be right <laughs> in certain instances but every once in a while yeah, like totally. this past weekend it pops up and you're like oh my god two brothers go around stabbing people for what and there's some reason yeah yeah apparently some of the people were targeted that's what they're saying yep. They're, yep but the rest weren't yep well here's a classic example the shooting on danforth mm -hmm. okay that was made out to be right away anti-female right i'm not sure Women. i know this okay so i don't remember the fellow's name but he decided one night he's going to walk down danforth with a 40 caliber pistol and start shooting into restaurants and targeting Whoa. women okay okay so the backstory to this this is all prior to this happening he had a brother who was involved in criminal activity up there with drugs and guns and whatever had, had either been charged and was on release and given supposed to go to some family member's place to stay and if the story is correct it's somewhere in whitby oshawa something like that so we're talking a couple of years maybe three years whatever prior to the this shooting on the danforth so the brother is staying at his uncle's place court order he's got to stay there either waiting trial or after trial this is where you got to be so that location the fire department was called one time and uh somebody's smoke detector kept going off so the fire department shows up there's stink throughout the building so they go there kick the door open holy crap put on hazmat suits go in there find the brother on the floor okay unconscious and it's uh, 45 kilos of carfentanil 45 kilos enough to kill Whoa. all of canada three times over <clears throat> and a bunch of guns and ensuing investigations found 30 something brand new Glocks in the box that had been stolen during some shipment to a, some police department sometime before. Some 50 guns, there was 33 or something. So start moving forward towards the Danforth Shooters event. They're using this event. 
and obviously police are doing their their investigation and i don't remember the exact number but we'll say there there's you know six uh, 160 guns or something like that were seized throughout the next two years by going through the criminal network um a whole bunch of charges and lots of drugs and whatever but during that period you'll also notice that the government started handing out noxalone kits free everywhere do you think that's because Noxal- pe- noxalone you know to stop yourself from right right overdosing do you okay. think that was because people are overdosing and i'm not a criminal or a conspiracy theorist but when i know that there's people out there making carfentanil and they're unsavory characters potential not saying it was but potential terrorist activity hmm, maybe we should start handing noxalone kits out to everybody because all it would take was somebody with uh, carfentanil dust a few uh you know subway railings and that's it you're gonna kill a whole whack of people so during that investigation for the next few years they bag a whole bunch of people they arrest a whole bunch of people um the other brothers in saskatchewan where the gun was apparently stolen from but he in toronto ended up with it so you've got to ask yourself well how did he get that gun was it his brother i don't know was it through the family i don't know but the moment that guy walked on danforth and started shooting people uh, a lawyer jumped in to protect the family to make sure it didn't turn into anti-Muslim terrorist thing, uh, which it wasn't. It was terrorism in a different level. Some guy just wanted to go shoot women. And it's horrific in every way, shape, and form. I was sick. Of, they shot people in the very restaurant I sit in. It was in my neighborhood. Of course I'm pissed off. But what I say to that is, what was happening for the last couple of years with that, that same family? Did law enforcement know? Why did... Uh, why was the whole previous investigation, why was that kind of like covered up and Canadians didn't know? Why, why didn't they say things to people? They say, hey, yeah, the family's known. Known to police. Nope, you're not known to police. Nope, this is anti, this is uh, a misogynistic guy trying to kill women. And that's what he did. But is that really his motivation? Nobody will ever know. But guess what? Let's ban handguns. That's what came out of that. We need a handgun ban. Let's forget about all the other shit, the, the, the illegal part, the gangs, the drugs, and whatever that was going on before and continues on to today. I mean, all you have to do is talk to a major crimes unit officer in any district of Toronto and just say, so uh, how many gangs are in our area, like in the beaches area of Toronto where I live? They'll give you a number and you sit there with your eyes open like pie plates. Citizenry in our country just doesn't want to know. They would rather be home in their beds, feeling safe that guns are banned and that everything is fine. When truthfully, if Canadians really knew what was going on in our country, on every single level of criminal activity, they wouldn't sleep. They wouldn't sleep at all. So what do you do? Do you tell everybody the truth or do you hide it from them and use it as a political tool to further your agenda? That's what's going on. Absolutely. I'm speechless. I was unaware of all of that. Yeah. And yeah, you probably ask wild. yourself how I know. Right? right? Just a second. I've been asking. Myself. Charlie, how, how do you know? <laughs> well, I can neither confirm nor deny where I got the information from, but let's just say it's in individuals who are no longer <clears throat> work, working in the system, who had intimate knowledge, and who are, let's just say, pissed off that stuff was not done. And you'll, ha- you'll have to excuse me. Like, I... In my career, I've been, I've been extremely lucky and privileged to meet not only guys that work for me, but guys that I've met throughout the industry and law enforcement who have spent their entire lives protecting Canadians and put their lives on the line every single day. Yeah. But what always gets in the way is politics, policy, and um, uh, testosterone, let's just say, um, with doing their job. They can't, they're not allowed to do the job they think they should do because there's policy decisions that are made. And then you look at the, just the Toronto police service, how many officers they've lost that retired and said, screw this, I'm done. I'm out of here. Yeah. I've heard a lot about this. A a police officer told me once, he said, you become a policeman. He says, if you haven't learned it within the first five to six years, then you're not paying attention. And I said, what's that? He says, the first thing I learned, it was like, I was five years on the job. And he said, this job's fucked right? Because you're not allowed to do things. And now it's worse today 
than it was when I first started. I, you know, in the 80s, cops driving around in yellow cars with the red lights on it, pull you over, say, hey, son, how you doing? Where are you going? Oh, I'm just going to a party. You've been drinking? No, sir. All right, can I smell your breath? Yes, sir. Yep. Okay, have a good night. 100%. Can't do that today. We all work with you, a lot of cops. Because you might hurt somebody's mm -hmm. feelings. Like, really? Yeah. We all work with a lot of cops. And I never fail to ask the cops when I'm working with them about guns and things of that nature. I'm interested in that. Yeah. <clears throat> and every one of them has said, we absolutely know that that car with those three guys, there's guns in there. And there's nothing they can do about it. Well, actually, there is, but they're not allowed to. Well, that's my point. But I, if it was me running the show, <clears throat> I would say it's 3.30 in the morning. Yep. We're in a known drug area, and there's a car. We've seen it in the last five minutes whipping around. We're seeing drug deals going on. So we're just going to stop him and have a chat with him. Okay? We're going to search the car. And if we find any illegal stuff in there, we're not going to charge him. We're going to take it. We're going to take their guns. We're going to take their drugs and say, hey, don't be doing that again. So they walk away. They're not getting charged, but you're getting their guns. But they won't do that because we've set it up in such a way that people's civil rights or their rights to privacy does not allow law enforcement to stop. And that is strictly because there's always the cop that goes way too far. That's no. got a badge and a license to be God, and they're not. Mm. And that's therein lies the problem. And some we of need the more big... robocops. Yeah, we need we need more officers that <laughs> speaking um, of movies. You yeah. know, we just need more. You know, w w like Toronto could add easily fifteen hundred new officers, and still not have enough to do what's needed. Well, I, I was just talking to a, a friend of mine who's a police officer, and uh, they were saying that. Uh, that in where they are, I mean, uh, all the veteran guys, all the guys that they really need, uh, helping and teaching, uh, the new guys and, uh, being an influence, they're all dropping. They're just like, screw this. I want to retire early. I, I, this is just getting stupid. And they were, they were saying how a lot of cops don't even, if, if they pull somebody over and somebody says, well, I don't identify as, as what you're calling me. A lot of cops now are just backing out. Okay. Fuck it. I don't want to hurt anybody. I don't want to hurt myself. I got my career, my life, my family. Yeah. Um, fuck it. And yeah. then and let somebody go based on silly politics. Yeah, well, one of the the issues we see all the time is with uh, law enforcement is that they're, uh, the, the senior police constable on a division at any, begin, any given night was like, he's got six or eight years on the job. I was senior PC. Jesus. You're like, what? He says, oh, yeah, in my division, senior PC was like eight years on the job. And then we got some, some sergeants came from other divisions. There's guys left and whatever. Then you have a guy, one is a friend of mine. He's in a division. He's a, been a copper now like 10 years, and he's the senior PC in his division. You think 10 years, that's it? You think senior PC is like 20, 25 years or something. But no, it's just they just don't have the bodies. And, you know, at my cottage... Where, where we are, there's all retired policemen from Toronto and there's military people and whatever. And that is the topic of, of uh, conversation all the time. Whenever you're up there, you say, hey, I saw this on the news. I said, yeah, I don't care. Don't care. When I was a cop, you know, those stories. Right. When I was a policeman or after 33 years of policing, I can tell you this. And they did a lot of unsavory stuff back during those times, which is why we have things different today. But we've gone too far the other way. Yeah, the pendulum has swung and it's not coming back. It could, no. it, we've crossed a line we didn't have to get back. Yeah. 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 So, and now w when you fast forward that into our job, our industry, we've gone the way of, well, here we've had yet again another accident. Let's ban guns. No more gunfire. Let's do this. You're like, oh, okay. So now we're we're trying to you know, put the guy back on top of the horse and realize that, you know, we can do this safely. We can still have a good day. Everybody can go home. Uh, but there are those people out there that just doesn't matter. I did a show a little while ago that's still shooting now where they wanted me to be their armor, but I'm considered a vendor, right? So they're calling me and said, oh, you have to do um, these uh, assessments and whatever 
um, for security and sa safety assessments. And I said, well, I'm not your employee, I'm your vendor. So for me to do an assessment for safety on your production is actually a conflict of interest. You know, that's like giving the job to the fox to say, do the safety plan for the hen house, right? <laughs> right? It's serious. No, you no, know, that's good. I'm not your employee. Now, if I was your employee, I would give you a, uh, a survey of the safety stuff. But they say, Here, here's the script. Could you do a safety assessment on that? So, well, what are we doing? The script says A, B, C, D, but what actually are we doing? And they're like, oh, well, what do you need? I said, well, who's doing stunts? Could I talk to them? And they're like, yeah, I don't know what we're doing either. So productions are wanting to do things to check off boxes to satisfy studio executives or insurance companies or lawyers right. or whatever, but they're actually not interested in doing it correctly and paying people to do that. That's a little, that's a tough pill for me to swallow. So I just said, I'm not doing it. I'll do if you if you want me to do a security assessment or safety assessment on your show, then you hire me, you pay me, and I will do that. But they were doing things like, okay, so Johnny pulls a a rubber gun out or, or a replica gun out and he points it at actor B and C. So we need you to do a, a, an assessment for that. I'm like, no. Like there's all these parameters that I have to go through. And then it has to go down to the studio where the executive says, yeah, okay, I think, we, I think we'd safely do that. And then it goes up. So it all has to be done two to three weeks in advance of doing the shot. But hang on a second. Aren't we shooting that tomorrow? Right. So that's the craziness of some of this where there's, it's gone way too far the other way. I said, no, no, we have to do assessments for everything we do. I said, well, you're never going to do anything then. So why don't you just say no gunfire and no guns? Yeah, but it's a gun movie. Okay. And I'm not trying to be disrespectful or rude. It's like there's some... Oh, somebody said that when, when common sense becomes commonplace, we don't need cops, right? And it's just not common sense. They're, they think it is because it's what the lawyers want or it's what the studio executives want. But you look at the process, you're like, oh, my God. We do the same thing. We have to do a, a stunt assessment for each show, yep. each scene, each stunt. But you're an employee of the production. Right, but, and I don't mind doing that. Yep. So that said... Um, prior to actually getting on set, I don't know what we're doing either. Despite the fact it says it in the script, despite the fact having a conversation with the producer and the director about how he wants it done, it's still, I don't know. So at the end of everything, I always state that this means nothing. Everything I've said herein means nothing because it's it creative difference, creative decisions made on set. Almost can, never does it actually say, stay the same. <clears throat> right. No, and almost never. The insurance company is going to go back to that letter and say, you didn't do it this way. If someone was hurt, well, then let's discover whether or not the creative changes were made on set after three weeks later after I wrote yeah. this silly thing. Yeah. Um, that's why I always put that clause, <laughs> I always put that clause in there. Yeah, yeah it's, mm -hmm. that's the one thing about our job that's, you know, there's the... the um, above the line people who are trying to keep safe and make sure nobody gets hurt and they're the ones paying the bill and the insurance companies the studios and whatever wouldn't want their job for all the tea in China I just wouldn't right I like the creative action mm -hmm. shoot them up go on the set you know like I said earlier shooting guns and blowing shit up and you know <laughs> and walking away and nobody gets hurt everybody's like yeah that was awesome and then seeing it on camera and all the stuff that we've done for all these years. Mm -hmm. That's that's what I like about it. All the other stuff, the politics and the, you know, stroking people's shoulders, making sure they all feel comfortable. Um, that gets a little old. Yeah. And so at the end of the day, politics, uh, in your opinion, might be what happened on Rust. You said the COVID thing. Uh, is that really, is that what got in the way? No, I think what got in the way... Uh, is is uh, the actual report states that there may be some civil uh, civil culpability to the producers and the PM and the first AD for not following basic like very, safety protocols, very basic safety calls. Oh, okay, for the instance of trying to save money and time. And as you guys well know, don't <laughs> rush into a gunfight. Don't run in. Walk understand rehearse plan walk in let's shoot it let's go home because when you rush in 
this is invariably the kind of thing that can happen and it can happen simply as you know special effects steel cable that's yanking a vehicle that's anchored in the ground in a hurry and it was never really assessed by an engineer but it was done that way because we need the car to go this way in the shot instead of that way and they do it and on the take it gets yanked out of the ground right oh um, yeah and that's happened and it you're not has. and I've you're not it. and you're not blaming people but it's just the thing is that this shit happens you know i was in uh on death race in montreal and that was one of the biggest gun movies gun movies i've ever done with the emo- most amount of gunfire like we shot <laughs> tons of ammo not thousands of rounds tons of ammo and uh, we had a test being done by the special effects guys where they were taking a car up a up a slide and pitching in the air up, up over a wall so they were doing the test right up behind my armory building there was like a hundred people around there. And I just walked over to one of the guys and said, you know, in all, all honesty, people, I wouldn't be standing here if I was you. And they're like, well, why not? The effects guy said we could. And the, the local effects guy, the American guys, no, everybody's fine. And I'm like, yeah, okay. I told my guys, no, over here, be by the sea can at the door. You don't need to be over there. And sure enough, the car got launched. The turnbuckle at the end of the ramp broke because the stroke was too long, too much nitrogen, maybe water in the nitrogen cylinder. The nitrogen cylinder went off. This turnbuckle that probably weighed 50 pounds flew backwards like a bullet, hit about eight feet above everybody's head, and wow. ricocheted off the wall and traveled another 30 feet and hit the side of a seat container. And people ducked because it was like, when it was over. Wow. And, you know, we lost a good friend um, mm-hmm. a couple of years ago with that exact same thing. Yeah. You know, is there, you know, is there you, you aiming fingers and say, it's your fault? No, it's shit happens you know when we're trying to do something maybe we're trying to push the limit a little bit or we're doing something or maybe maybe something like that i'm not blaming anybody or pointing fingers at anybody because it's it's just the way it is in life we plan we try we try to get things to be right and sometimes invariably shit happens but it's if you have a plan of safety and cordoning and whatever the explosions going off no you can't be there you got to be over there everybody back you don't need to be here go away go to the craft truck and go get a sandwich or something you know because you got a stunt guy that's you know gonna drive his car go off a ramp and he's gonna go on fire and he's gonna crash into a truck or something like that you know shit flies sometimes stuff happens and if you don't need to be there don't and that invariably is the problem with our industry is stuff happens and then we go way too far and blaming people and changing things when if we just did the basic safety stuff. My old adage is if you can see the bomb, the bomb can see you. Yes. You were going to say? Well, I was just going to say that uh, safety protocols should be put in place because of the things we don't see coming. Doesn't that just make sense? Yep. I mean, what what your call to your guys to, you know, just you don't got to be there, so don't. It just makes so much freaking sense. It's yeah. stupid. Well, I was it's in stupid. I was in Mexico, in Veracruz, and there was a helicopter right above my head with uh, uh, Captain Prince, the actor, and he's down yelling "enemies to peace." And I, the helicopter's right above my head, about twenty feet, and I'm standing here. I'm looking up, and all the crews there, and he's hovering above the entire set. The cameras are on him, lights and what are searchlights. And I just thought to myself, I don't need to be here. So I, <laughs> no, I'm serious. And I was like, I stepped back and I grabbed a couple of the girls. So let's go over here. They go, why? And I said, because if he has a mechanical problem, guess where he's coming? Right yeah, here. Yeah, hell yeah. And then a couple of days later, I was in that helicopter hanging out the side as the sniper with a harness on and whatever flying around the, the, uh, the, uh, the Mexico City. You know, first stunt. Last stunt, you know. What I mean? <laughs> That's you know, awesome. I was just gonna ask what. You know, no, I, I did seriously. They said we, we need you because we're we're gonna land at the airport and the armor needs to be there. The guy with the license, so yeah. get up there. So cool. I was behind a machine gun, That's and cool. next thing you know, I'm hanging out as a as a as a sniper. A sniper. And then one of the uh, stunt guys from out west, he was the real sniper, hanging out and had to yank him in a couple times because he was hanging out too far and his legs got shaky and because he was out there forever, and it was you know. <laughs> A little Wild West-ish, right? It was awesome. No incident? No, no okay, incident. Cool. But I have been in a place where, you know, a little bird helicopter went up and it was above the firing line and uh, getting ready to fire and all of a sudden it had a me- uh, mechanical malfunction 
he ditched to the right and landed in the parking lot where people were sitting and standing. Nobody got hurt. But it's like how easy it can happen, and you're right. You plan for the... Unforeseen. Unforeseen. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, when I'm on set, I mean, I was on set Triple X with you guys when uh, uh, there was a ton of people there, man. And most of them were stunt... Or some of them were stunt guys, but most of them were BG. And I think about stuff like you said earlier that... You know, uh, you have so many guys on your uh, in your budget. Mm-hmm. I just don't get how people don't see how this makes so much sense. I'm on set uh, with your guys all the time, and I always think every time I get uh, my firearm handed to me or I hand it back, I do think to myself, there are not enough guys. There's never. I don't think there's ever enough nope. uh, guys in in, in uh, your crew. Like 300 people on set. Most of them aren't stunt guys. Most of them don't give a shit. Yeah, well, when I told you about that show in uh, Morocco, Path 9-11, we're in a country they don't even speak English. So we have, them, we have one afternoon, and I hand them all an AK or a PKM or something, and I don't speak their language. And they, they some of them speak French, you know, some of them Arabic, whatever. I don't know. So we had to do the simplest thing. That when you put the safety on, it's called security, right? Security on, security off. Load, make ready, you know, and load the round. So we, I would say to them, load. So they take their magazine, they put it in the gun. Security, safety on. So we would do that and repeat and repeat and repeat until they all did it correctly. Because when I handed them a gun, I had to give them the magazine in their hand. And they had to walk out in the field 100 yards away, okay? And these are not stunt people. These are background performers all playing either a Northern Alliance fighter or a Taliban Mm -hmm. or a villager or something. And you go, there you go. And then on the bullhorn, I go, everybody, load. And invariably, you hear the boom, right? And then you have to walk out. And (laughs) because of the cultural differences, you can't take a a young Arabic man and yell at him because it's disrespectful to do that in front of others. So you got to go up and unload and say, no, nope, load. That's it. Security. And you have to do that with people who don't speak English. And you have to do that in one day. And then that afternoon, you do a gun battle with these guys with French stunt guys that some speak English, some don't. And uh, uh, some other British armors. One guy was from Tupara. Another guy was from some other... Thing and they're like drill sergeant type yelling and screaming at people they don't care <laughs> the effects guys are british i mean it was fabulous you can ask al berkland what they about uh you know we're getting ready to go hot you know i'll go on the radio hey al yep go hot with the guns then all of a sudden you hear pop, 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 pop. and one of the french guys tur- flips the safety off on his pkm machine gun sitting inside a truck and dumps four or five rounds inside the truck <laughs> oh my god that's a stunt guy a train, oh, a train stunt guy. So yeah. you know that stuff happens, but how many armors should I had that day? 15, 20, yeah. you know, would have been, yeah. would have been fine. But we did it with what we had and we made it happen. And I said at that time, I'm never going to do that again. That's not going to happen ever again. If you want to do it with four, get somebody else. It's not going to be me because it's just a recipe. And then we went and did Hyena Road in Jordan and it was just Paul and I. But the good thing is, is all the cast were military guys. Just like on... Man, it was a good Mer- movie. Mer- yeah, I enjoyed that film. Mayor Kingstown, same thing. Got the SWAT guys, whew, I'm good. Mm-hmm. We don't trust mm-hmm. Randy, but... Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, good thing I wasn't on the team. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but that was, uh, that was kind of a highlight in the past few years of, of stuff we've done. I'm pretty proud of all the guys, all the training, how you all looked. Um, my staff and the guys that put the equipment together yeah. and the gear... Um, as, as our, uh, illustrious director wanted, you know, when he's like, Hey, I want it real. I want our guys, our, our, our team to look like, Hey, these guys are all operators. Yeah. Shout out to Taylor Sheridan. Yeah. Uh, the writer creator, uh, along with, uh, Hugh Dillon for mayor of Kingstown, but that was a bit of an anomaly that show. Yeah. Um, you know, Taylor's a, a force of nature and what he wants, he gets, and we had the ability to go into the studio for a week with you, with the SWAT guys, 
with the military guys and train and get it all down before ever going to set. Yep. And uh, we shot a thousand or more rounds in training. Yeah. Think about it. I mean, it's just, it was awesome. Distraction devices, the whole yeah, thing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Flashbangs and uh, shotguns. Yep. Um, we don't do enough of that. No, we don't. No, we don't. Um, I've been on shows where we trained the odd actor for a couple of hours or we sent them to you. Hmm. But um, this was, uh, like I say, it was an anomaly. Yeah. And, you know, the interesting thing for us is that way we, we did a season of Reacher and the, the fight coordinator, stunt coordinator, they're always great with us, you know, because my guys are military guys. They say, hey, you wouldn't do it that way. Let's let's work something out. Or training happens and the stunt coordinator is with us. And sometimes they're not, but most times they come to the training to see and discuss. So this is the action that we're going to be story, storyboarding about what we're going to do. And it's always great, the collaboration between my department, the stunt department, the effects department, and then production. Uh, but it it's not always smooth. Like, like you said earlier, there are a lot of times we go to set, we have no idea what, what is going to happen. I don't want to use the term. We don't know what we're doing, right? But we know exactly what we're going to do. We can be thrown into a situation that's okay, Charlie. So we want to have two guys over here running and shooting and the effects is going to blue bullet hits and blah, 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 blah. And you want to go by camera, whatever. So what do you think? Say, okay. And then we just take charge. It's just walk right in and say, everybody pay attention this, 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 or the stunt coordinator does it in concert with us. Right. And you lay it out and say, what do you guys think? Camera operators are in there and everybody's working together as a cohesive team to make, you know, everything work. And, um, that's generally 99% of the time what happens, except for those days when you walk in, it's hurry up and let's go. Nope. Nope. Yeah. Frenchie Berger told me once, he says, the louder you, that you yell, the slower I go. And he's not wrong. Yeah. I had this conversation mm. with a producer the other day. Something happened and I said, producers don't yell at me. Directors don't yell at me. And I don't run. And I, I've said many times to actors and other stunt performers that the faster they go, the slower we go. Yeah. It's just when they want to push, 100%. We, we just, we just yeah. absolutely slow down. You stay with me and everything will be fine. Just it slows down. Totally. There was a, an incident way back many years ago with an actor. And um, I don't want to, I don't like using the terminology B actor, but it was kind of a B movie mm -hmm. we were in. And I spoke to the director in the morning about a specific shot about these guys shooting aliens. And, you know, I think it would be awesome when he goes to leave, he does a sort of a combat withdrawal where he's dumping rounds fully automatic at all the beasts, does a mag change dumps a couple more rounds and then beetles back with his team. He goes, oh, that would be awesome. So we get there in the afternoon and the actor's there and we're getting on set and they're all dressed up. We're getting ready to do this. And I said, hey, listen, so this morning I was speaking to the director about this particular shot and obviously you're going to do it with the way you want, but I'd mentioned to him that it might be kind of cool, blah, 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 and you're going to shoot like this. And he goes, yeah, okay, I'll go talk to him. So then he walks right back, like right across the set, and I could see it in his eyes. He's pissed off. He comes over to me and he starts yelling at me at the top of his lungs. Don't you effing ever tell me something da 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 that the director da blah. And I and I stood there, and I'm not one to get yelled at. Like I, I don't take it very well. So I said to him, "Are you finished?" And he looks me right in the eyes. Said, are, seriously, are you done? Okay. First of all, number one. Don't you ever speak to me like that again. That's the first. Number two, who the hell do you think you are talking to anybody on a film crew that way? You go back to the director and everybody could hear because now I'm yelling at him. So you go back to the director and you ask him if he remembers the conversation with Charlie this morning. We had at 8 o'clock, probably about 8.05 about this shot. And you ask him again if he had that conversation. He's all puffy chest and he says, well, this is ridiculous. It doesn't work this way and whatever. I said, well, you best go talk to him. Either that or step outside. We'll have our conversation outside. Not to go have a fight, but right. just like take it outside. Oh, damn. Okay. And uh, yeah. Yeah, I was looking forward to that story. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, that's a Charlie Sheen story. But anyways. Uh, <laughs> so so uh, he went back and then he came back and then he tried to apologize to me. And I said, I understand you're trying to apologize, uh, give me an apology. That's fine. And don't really accept it. 
but just understand you don't talk to people that way. And I've seen it many times where a director is yelling, props, props, props. And the DOP turns around and says, uh, props has a name, it's so-and-so. Okay, yeah, so-and-so. Like you've been working with for months. People need to know people's names. You know, guns, where's guns? No, how about where's Charlie? Or where's Al? Where's here? You know, learn their names. Totally. You know, and that's one of the problems. There's in some cases, the hierarchy of the people in charge, like on Suicide Squad, when I had a producer been on the show for months, we do a big spread of the guns for the uh, EPK people and whatever. And he comes over and he looks at me, he goes, you are uh, the producer. I said, Charlie, guns, you know, your armor, the guy that built all these things. Oh, yeah, yeah. Hey, Charlie. Be like, oh, geez, really? Man. Yeah. Makes yeah, you feel I mean, important. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. Uh, Makes well, you feel that at the end of the day... little respect goes a long only, way. At the end of the day, the most important thing is I want to feel good that, that I did a good job. I don't really care what anybody else thinks. As long as I feel good that I went home, I did my best. Because that's all we can ask for is that we did our best. And that when you look on the camera, you go, yeah, look I'm good. pretty proud. Yeah, yeah, the movie looked like shit, but the gunfire was great. <laughs> you know, <laughs> stunts were great. You know, I've been in a lot of those. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's the most important part. That, 100%, 100%. You know, and, and you develop friendships, you know, and uh, lifelong friendships, really. Yeah. And that we get to, you know, do the greatest job in the world. That's the most important thing about what we do. Yeah. Yeah. It starts with being a boy, man. We, we all start out wanting to make movies. And a lot of the time people veer off into uh, other things, business. Yeah. Remember what I said when we you started? Know. What's a gun guy? What's an armor? What is that? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I had no idea. My father was a butcher. I worked in his butcher store. So was Andrews. My, 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 yeah, yeah, my uh, dad's a butcher. I went, I, went to, <laughs> uh, uh, I went to church. I was sang in the choir. I did all that you know, stuff. Yeah. And I came out of high school with learning how to talk to people and work in my dad's store and deal with the, uh, the, the, the woman who wants a certain type of marbling in her pork chop and, you know, or steak that has a certain amount of fat or whatever and just learn how to talk to people. And you, know, you take that fast forward into the film industry you learn how to talk to people, you, you know, to uh, say command a room when you need to be listened to or heard that you can talk to people about whatever it is you need to talk to, whether it's a uh, safety meeting or whatever, and that you feel you have confidence in, um, in what you do. And I remember Al coming to me one time and saying, so what is it with uh, all the girls and the gun guys? Like, what is it about the gun guys that you know, the women are always talking to you guys. And uh, one of our makeup ladies who sadly passed away not that long ago, she went up to him and said, uh, you know, it's, it's the gun guys are mysterious. They're always quiet and confident. They don't smile a lot. They're just standing on set looking kind of cool and dangerous and whatever. Women like that. that that's what I'm going to do from <laughs> yeah, now on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's funny because it's true. There's somebody said to me, Oh yeah, one of the other guys over there was wondering like, "What's wrong with you? Are you are, are you are you upset today?" And I said, "No. Why? Do I look mad?" She goes, "Yeah. Why does Charlie Taylor always look mad?" <laughs> and then that same woman turned around and said to her, "Honey, don't misconstrue anger with focus." Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I thought you were just over there looking cool. No, yeah, I was just and mysterious, look at this bad looking <laughs> motherfucker. <right? laughs> And now that he's got a beard, it, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it just yeah. adds so much. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Now you know he's been hot. At, he's been at, <laughs> he's been at the cottage, <laughs> which we do. I, I do as much as possible. You know, I set it up where I can do my job from there. I can do budget phone calls. You know, on the computer. I got whatever. I got Elon Musk's uh, uh, RV internet, which is pretty cool. I'm just on the eastern, really? the eastern edge of Algonquin Park. You know, water access only and. It's nice. It's quiet, but I can still do my job. Right on. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah, now, cool. in terms of, uh, I mean, I've been to your armory, uh -huh. and uh, from what I understand, it's not everything you have. Uh, you have a lot more. <laughs> I know. Don't, don't maybe tell I'm wrong. Everybody. I could be wrong. <laughs> Just tell me I'm wrong. You're, no, you're uh, wrong. No, no, you're wrong. Because it, it, once upon a time, we couldn't find a place in the city. And I, back in 2009, when the mayor and his cronies decided uh, we're going to ban guns and shooting ranges and whatever in Toronto. Funny enough, myself and my business partner were the only people, and I mean the only people, who fought the city and said, this is ridiculous. 
Like what? what wow. are we, like what mm. are we gonna do now? I you know I called the film unions, I called the producers and whatever, and you know even Film Ontario said, well this is political, we can't get involved. And I said, well, you got a multi billion dollar film ministry in Toronto, and you have the mayor and his cronies because somebody one of his friends got shot from a gang member that he wants to like ban handguns in the city and like that's gonna f- like what and banning businesses like us like oh well we gotta go now we gotta go to mississauga or york region or durham like this is nuts anyways they actually the city council members specifically the mayor and some people in committee actually did some nefarious activity that ended up they got caught by us and wow. at the 11th hour it was uh yeah just bring your mic in the, the 11th hour was you know well, we're going to offer a settlement. You know, we're going to drop the bylaw, but we're going to get rid of shooting ranges and you can't manufacture guns in Toronto. Okay, whatever. Wow. Jesus, man. And that cost, you know, $40,000. Nobody else fought it. None of the other gun guys fought it. None of the other businesses, gun shops, nobody else fought it. It's like, really? Really? And And now same with this new gun ban stuff we've i've been fighting it since kim campbell put out bill c-17 and and then um alan rock and Cretchen put out uh, bill c-68 and uh, all the other amendments and now trudeau and whatever because we noticed that you know we, as we keep banning guns and moving through the process of banning and banning and restricting legal people that the gun problem gets worse and worse and worse because it has no effect on politics, right? And it's amazing that we, as a company, have fought for our own livelihood from the beginning to now and continue, and we really, truthfully, don't get the support that I believe we deserve from the rest of the film community. Guys like you, yes, but I'm talking about the people who are wielding the dollars, the guys building the studios. Right. Um, Hmm. We don't. Because they said, oh, well, you have an exemption, don't you? And I go, well, yeah. I said, yeah, but if I buy stuff every day from Canadian Tire, let's say, and they ban Canadian Tire stores. But Canadian Tire doesn't sell bolts anymore, and it's the only place to buy bolts. And we buy bolts every day. Now we have to special order bolts from the states, and it takes three months for a permit, and you know, some, you might get it in six months. How does that work? So the federal government just cut off our supply chain. No more dealers, no more suppliers, no more can I pick up the phone and call a wholesaler and say, hey, I need six more Glock 17s or whatever. I can't do that because guess what? They don't have them. So now I have to buy them myself from the states, spend way more money than I should in the first place, have a bigger inventory because you know what it's like at our place. You have everything, or at least what you think you have everything. Right. And then when that director shows up, he wants something you don't have because it's brand new. It's a new, it's a new widget. It's a new sure super duper handgun. <clears throat> totally. Not and, to mention customized and all kinds of other yep. attachments and other things that go yep. along with and it. And then you have to fly them in, or you know, have an open permit. You know, like we have got a permit from the United States Open for like a couple hundred thousand a year, and then try to fill it within the six to eight month period of buying stuff and then having it sitting there like blanks. You know, we had a we hmm. have a real run and shortage on blanks right now because there's no primers, there's no powder, there's no brass because, you know, we got a war going on, right? Mm-hmm. So the film industry is last. And when you go to a firearms manufacturer, you say, hey, I really want your gun in this next movie we're doing. They don't give a rat's ass. They don't care. Because you want to know why? Because Hollywood and the actors and whatever are constantly lambasting guns. We should ban guns. But the producers want that gun in that movie. True enough. Isn't that so silly? Oh, my God. Our industry, we've always said our industry is nothing more than storytelling. Like our industry is a book. It just happens to be an open book, right? And, you know, I'm a firm believer that if you don't like that genre of the book or... That one in the library, don't pick it up and don't read it. Don't go watch it, whatever. If you don't don't want your kids to watch it, don't go watch it. But for us, we're storytellers, right? And, Absolutely. And our stories, you know, some of the stories that were written many hundreds of years ago are horrific. Beheadings and 
strong quartering and just imagine if you took those movies and put it on a screen oh yeah vikings you know and you know you don't have to watch it but it is it's telling a story of humanity and history current past and sometimes that involves guns but we have people like Dwayne the Rock Johnson had the greatest respect for him until that day. He says, yeah, I'm never going to use another gun on a movie set. It's like, oh boy. It's pure ignorance, huh? Really? Really? Hmm. No, it's politics. Yeah, it's politics. He's, oh, he's yeah, right. Trying to look good somehow. Yeah. And, you know. True. Okay. You know, and then you see the good guys who are, uh, you know, action stars like Arnold. And he's here in Toronto. And yeah, you want me to shoot what? Where? When? Yeah. Okay. That way? Yep. Okay. Shoot, move on, carry on. Because we know what we're doing, hmm. right? Then there's the others like, a gun? Why? And then there's this whole drama of why is there a gun on set? And some actors having a meltdown that somebody brought a real gun on set and they have a moment and they're, okay, get that gun off set. Who, who, who authorized that gun to be there? Well, hang on a second. It's on the call sheet. You guys called us and told us to be here. You read the script. You're holding a gun. Yeah. That kind of stuff. So it's... I love my job, but sometimes it's like, I need to take a pill. Right? <laughs> yeah. So um, what's, your, what's your favorite story in the film business? Hmm. Well, one of the stories when I was working with Frenchie, on the, uh, I, I don't want to embarrass people, so I'm not going to mention the movie, where you know he said, yeah, can you help me out? I want you to go to the show and bring these muskets and whatever, whatever. But the guy owes me some money, right? He owes me like whatever, five, ten thousand dollars. And you tell him from me that he has to give you money today or there's nothing gonna happen. So I see him on set and I say, Hey, listen, Frenchie called me and said this is yeah, 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 I know, I know, yeah. I'll have a check for you at the end of the day. So okay. Because you know, if the money's not flowing, yeah, pe people aren't coming, right? And like I said, I wouldn't want to be a producer in a low budget show that doesn't have enough money to make it in the first place. So they sh really shouldn't be making it because you know they're going to screw somebody. Totally. Right. So they, uh, they said, yep, it'll come. So I get up in the morning at the hotel in, um, in Hamilton. I wake up in the morning. There's no envelope under the door. So I stay in my hotel room. So the phone rings. The call time was at seven. It's nine. <laughs> Hey, Charlie, it's first AD. Where are you? It's in my hotel room. He goes, what are you doing there? Your call time was seven. I said, yeah, I know. He said, go talk to so-and-so. He knows why I'm sitting in my hotel room. He goes, oh, geez, are you kidding me? And I said, nope. I got orders. Frenchie says, no way. And when he says no way, yeah, man. it's no way, yeah. right? You're not going. <laughs> he says, oh, please don't do this to me. So then my phone rings later and it's the guy. And he goes, listen, I, I, I'm sorry, I forgot about putting on your, yeah, I'm, I'm on set over here. So we get there, and he has the grips and the electrics, camera guys, everybody helping bring me all my stuff down to set. And my other guy has been sitting in the parking lot for two hours, my assistant. I just told him, just wait there. So we arrive, so everybody helps me bring the guns in. The guy hands me an envelope, I stick it in my pocket. We get ready, they're all waiting for me. I hand the guns out, I load them all up, we do the, we do the shot. We work till, you know, whatever time we finish. I wrap, I go back to the hotel, I open the envelope. It's half the money. No. So I call Frenchie. Well, you know, he had some colorful, colorful French Parisian <laughs> language. <laughs> and uh, so I said, well, you call him and sort it out. And uh, I didn't go back for a couple of days until it got sorted out. But then fast forward to I'm in uh, Jordan doing a picture and uh it's called redacted and i brought a, a five ton truck worth of u.s military gear like the real stuff and some replica firearms and some real firearms for what we're doing and then another production rolls into town and says hey you're here the stuff's here can we rent it from you we don't need the guns because we have guns from somebody else but can we rent everything else like all the uniforms boots clothing everything and i said sure the hurt locker so they make a deal with me. Sweet. They give me a deposit. Everything's cool. Nicholas is the producer. And uh, the PM is there. Shake hands. Says, okay, you know, I'll expect a check when I get home. 
And so we said, yeah, we'll be finished at the end of August or whatever. So August comes and goes. Don't hear anything from anybody. So I call them up and say, hey, listen, what's happening to my stuff? Like, you're going to ship it back or what's the deal? Nobody's answering the phones. So I go through the USFX guys and said, yeah, we're having trouble getting our stuff. I said, it was a show over. They said, oh, yeah, it's over. So I'm like, uh-oh. So I called the Jordanian representative to the king, and I called him up and said, hey, I've got a problem. And he goes, oh, shit. And I said, yeah, you know, like a few hundred kilometers over the border is a war going on in Iraq with Americans wearing the same uniforms. And I said, the last thing I want to do is find out my government finds out that we su inadvertently supplied terrorists to go to a border town and kill a bunch of Americans wearing faking wearing American uniforms. So I want my stuff. So as it turns out, production sold my stuff. Whoa. To anybody who wanted to buy it. Okay. And including some companies in the United States and it's all gone. So the value of the equipment was like $220,000. It's not pocket change, right? And I went through multiple avenues to either A, get my stuff and B, get the money for it. And I got the key actor stuff that Western Costume was graciously willing to send to us, but it wasn't my stuff. It was their stuff that they rented. Or they kept my stuff, which is real, and they gave me all the shit stuff. But whatever. I got something back, but I didn't get the money. So we had to go through the whole process of trying to get paid. And then the producer, Nicholas, you know, was the kind of guy who was quite happy to screw you over whether you're an actor or a writer doesn't matter you know mark bowl was a writer he signed for my stuff personally as the producer i never saw a penny never got my stuff back and that's the part about this business that truly rubs me the wrong way and then what's even rubs you even worse is when the distribution company that distributed that movie and they win the lowest grossing movie ever to win six academy awards and the same producer gets kicked out of the academy for um, paying off people for votes for Hurt Locker. Why do you think it won so many Academy Awards? Well, that was a good movie. But it wasn't that great movie, you know, in comparison yeah. to some of the people it was up against. Sure. But I never got my money. And uh, then we were doing Red and uh, in the city. And then a random producer came up to me and said, hey, I'm distribution company, blah, blah, blah. And he says, what? I just want to hear your side of the story for Hurt Locker. So I tell him, the Reader's Digest version of the story, and said, hey, this is what happened. He said, wow, you're not going to hold that against us, are you? We're, we're, <laughs> we're, we're, we're the company that distributes the movie. Like, It's not our issue. And I said, no, it's fine. You know, I'll write it off, whatever. But it really bothered me. It still bothers me to this day. And I remember a conversation I had with an individual. I said, uh, you know, it's really too bad that film producers do this to people, writers, actors, low budget people, you know, suppliers that supply a bunch of equipment, and then you never pay them, they never get their stuff back, and they say, okay, sue me. Like, who cares? And I said, you know, it's no wonder police find bodies in a ditch with a bullet in their head <coughs> when you do this to the wrong kind of person. And that guy said, are you threatening me? And I said, no, I'm not threatening you. I'm just explaining Telling the story that... If you do this, you continue to do this, you might do it to the wrong person and find, you know, somebody's going to do something bad. And uh, anyways, I got a call from a few law enforcement agencies on that comment. Told them exactly what I said, and they go, yeah, okay, fine. Never saw or heard another word about it. But now I do business differently. You know, when it comes to the film industry and it comes to paying bills, I don't trust anybody. Sorry. It's, it's business is business. And a famous armor said to me once, he goes, when was the last time you went into the grocery store for two quarts of milk? And let's say the two quarts of milk are $2 and 60 cents. And you only, and plus tax or whatever. And you only got five bucks. He says, what did the grocery store usually say? Put one back, right? Mm -hmm. Totally. Film industry doesn't do that. He says, no, we, you know, we want more ammunition. So you're like, well, you're only budgeted for this. And you said, well, now, okay, Charlie, can we put five machine guns on those guys? Yeah, we can, but that's not in the budget. Okay, the director's authorizing it, right? Okay, well, okay, so you put five machine guns, and then they get the bill. They go, what the hell is this? Well, well, your budget says that. So, no, 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 no. On this day, 
director, see this. It's on the production report. And you have to go do that stuff, and then you still fight. There's still productions that have never paid us for stuff. We have a wall of shame. And they do it, and they nickel and dime. And then there's other studios that are just awesome. You do your budget, you do your paperwork, you put it in, you get paid. Everything's happy. And then there's others, you just months after the show's over, you're chasing it. That's the part of this industry I hate. I can't hmm. stand it. Um, my business partner had to go to a show and said, hey, we're not in the business of financing film productions. Maybe we should be, but we're not. So how about pay your bill or we're not coming in on Monday? And we're not the only ones. You know, it's tough when you have a show that goes to another country and you find out that the country has a tax uh, agreement with Canada that you can pay your income tax either but or country. So... They're taking your Canadian tax out of your paycheck plus this country's tax to the tune of like 60%. And then you're getting the difference and you have to wait a year after to file your taxes to get it back. Just turn your mic towards your mouth a bit. Yeah, sorry. That's good. That's all good. You can just turn that. It, it, it turns like this. Yeah. Like this. It? Yep. Like this. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah, right. Love it. All right. Just need to get closer. Yeah, now you sound like you're on the radio. Yeah, okay. Yeah, and it's uh, it's one of those things. So, you know, it doesn't matter where I go, I get paid here in Canada. Period. Because I worked in the U.S. and the U.S. takes their chunk and they have to file a U.S. tax return and you say, fine, you get this money back and you never see it. No, zero. Crazy. Yeah. Yeah, man, that's crazy. That That debt must be insane. That must bug you every day. Yep. But I tell the same story to productions when I say, hey, yeah, I need a $50,000 deposit before that stuff leaves the country. Or you have to pay for it or give me a, a, a secured line of credit or a letter of credit for the whole value. And they said, what? I said, yeah. Well, you can go talk to this guy about how he screwed me. And I'm not the only one. Trust me, I'm not the only one. I don't there's, imagine. There's productions yeah. that owe me money. There's productions that owe yeah, no, tons of people. Nothing of what you're saying surprises me. No. Are, At are, all. So you're not shocked. No, I'm not that shocked. Yeah. <laughs> but two hundred twenty thousand, you'd be shocked. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's yeah. wild, man. Fuck, yeah. But yeah, no. but yeah, that is crazy. Jesus, man. And you know the the worst part is stuff that you can't replace. Yeah. You know, nowadays it's there's permits and stuff, and that 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 stuff's just not available. It's historical. It's you know from the '90s radios, and, and that just you, just you can't buy it anymore. In terms what of tech. Uh, have you been asked to do something that has been extremely difficult, but pulled through? Yeah, Robocop. Okay. Hey, so we want to build some taser firing guns, but we, we need them to be full automatic. Or we need to have this huge, you know, dart gun thing, but we want it to fire like a machine gun. So I've, over the years, I've brought in uh, Walter Klassen, Taku, the guys over there. And uh, Peter Colpitz of Colpitz Design to help in the design phase of, okay, I'm going to work with you guys to do this gun, and I'm going to work with you guys to do that gun. Let's figure out how to put this gun in there. So we're sitting down. They're doing the CAD work and doing all that design work. And for those, <coughs> those shows, um, I've hired people out and probably continue to do that. Uh, same with Suicide Squad, you know, Classens and the guys were absolutely fabulous, John and uh, Taku and his crew did great, great, great work. Like, hey, let's make a uh, Glock fire and eject, but left hand. Oh, wow. Yeah. <coughs> right? I, don't have, I, I personally don't have the time to try to figure this out. I got other shit to do. So you have to farm stuff out sometimes, and uh, we have great technicians here in the city that do awesome stuff and putting it together um, like the quad firing machine gun on polar taku and the boys helped design it helped rig the guns they rigged the remote firing controls and even a uh, death race death race was one of the most technically difficult movies we've ever done like having all the guns firing on the cars where the stunt operators and drivers were firing them in the car. Oh, they had wow. They had complete control. They were all firing on nitrogen cylinders, 
and doing trigger mechanisms or electric. Everything from the miniguns Jeez. to the Vulcan. I brought my good friend Mike Papik up from Los Angeles and um, Bob Sika and um, Vince Flaherty. Uh, they came up and they ran the miniguns and the Vulcan cannon. Now, the Vulcan cannon was firing 12 gauge blanks with 80 grains of bullseye powder. And anybody that knows anything about pistol powder, that's a lot. And they went off like cams. And I remember the first time we tested them and uh, had the guns, you know, I don't know, fire 20 rounds or something. Shot the uh, mirror right off the side of the truck. I told them the mirror was in the wrong place. They said, it'll be fine. <laughs> and it sh uh, seriously, shot the mirror right off. So, Oh, my God. Yeah, yeah so from a technical standpoint, I think uh, Death Race was the most technically difficult and logistic speaking. And then we, we ran into some some issues with uh you know personality conflicts between provinces and um sabotage and other political union slash whatever stuff that goes on sometimes and uh but at the end of the day all the guys work together uh, but from a safety perspective that very first day we had all the vehicles we had you know a car with two mini guns and another car with uh, twin 50 cals and twin mg 42s on the vehicle insane and then other cars with 50s and and uh, other things and some trucks and whatever and on the very first day they said we're going to do gunfire on the very first shot so day one first shot okay what are we going to do so we're going to drive around this track and we're going to go by once and then when they come around they're going to open up so we say to everybody these things are extremely dangerous. Like we have six 50 cal sh shooting. We have twin Vulcan cannons. We have three or four miniguns and a whole bunch of other bell-fed machine guns all attached to cars, all going off, all firing all at the same time and firing at two different directions, front and back. So we said, okay, everybody, ears, eyes, protection, stay over here. Nobody goes in front of the cars. When we make them hot, the drivers will have their hands in the air like fighter pilots. Get your hands off the controls because I'm not loading this gun if I see your hands on the trigger. So then you go to the drivers, and they're all in walkie anyways. Just say, uh, how about uh, go hot? So they flip the arm switch up, and they still have their hands in the air. So their hands are not on the trigger. So okay. And roll sound, off they go. But before <clears throat> they go, there was a focus puller that walked out in front of the cars with a tape measure. And I screamed at him, Jeez. you know. And I used, <laughs> I used colorable, colorful language. There might have been an F in there somewhere to get back. And he ran back scared. But there were still people without hearing protection on. Oh, I'm good. Everything's fine. Everything's fine. So the cars went around the track. We came around the first time. They went around again. They came back. And as they're running around the corner, all the guns started going. The 50 cals, you know. Boop, 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 yeah, boop, that's boop, crazy. Boop, 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 boop. The mini guns. Then <clears throat> there's other machine guns. Da, 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 da. And it was so loud. And it was between these two rows of buildings, of which one was tin. Every time a 50 <laughs> went off, you heard, you heard boom, beer, boom, beer, <laughs> from the echo off the building. Right and on. there was people <clears throat> running for cover. Honest to God, they were running. They were so scared. And they went down, and they came around again, and you hear the director, you guys still have ammo? Yeah, we're still good. They kept firing, and it was done. The cars ran over the 50 cal brass. We had two vehicles that had flat tires because they ran right over the brass and got a flat tire. So then my guys drive down in the van. They all bail out. Everybody has their own vehicle, safe, calling the radio. Guns are empty and safe. So then, oh, we need a tire guy to change a tire we need this so you know 20 minute reset he's not in the budget yeah oh. <laughs> no we could do that again we did that for days days and days and then we did it uh, a second unit at the same time at another location in the middle of the night so i'm at the hotel i've just gone there to grab a couple hours sleep before having to go to second unit and i'm driving down and we're standing up in front of the sort of getting ready to get picked up and i stand in front of the hotel and i hear down the waterfront of Montreal. I said, yes, guys, yes. <laughs> I mean, the whole city. And then when the miniguns were going, oh, oh. oh and man. Was like, 
guy goes, stubborn neck, what is that? <laughs> you, know, like, <laughs> you know, that's us. Awesome. It was great. It was one of the best movies for like gun and action and guys. I had a great crew. Guys from Montreal were awesome. I had Andrew Campbell and this guy, Chris, Christian Aubry and his, uh, all his guys. And basically we had everybody that could possibly available to work, work on it. And they all worked together. It was a pretty cohesive group. It's no, no different than you have the stunt guys from all across the country in the U S all working together on a big project. Yeah. Gun totally. guys are the it's same. incredible. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> and, you know, you, you can take somebody from a different, totally different place and say, Hey, you're in charge of this and you know, I can walk away and they can handle it, you know, but it was, it was funny. The guns going off and watching people. Too laugh. cool, man. When, when the guns, when we yelled cut, you see how many people went looking for ear protection and eye protection. <laughs> I'd love to be in the car doing that. Oh my God. Oh yeah. It was cool. Yeah. Well, I don't think there's a stunt guy oh, alive that wouldn't love no, that. No. Yeah. Man, that what sounds awesome. And the drivers <clears throat> and our second unit director. Oh, yeah. He was doing shots, like laying down on a truck with a handheld, following the Vulcan cannon while it was firing. You know, I said, you're nuts, man. I'm like, here, put some, no, no, I'm going to put a blanket on and a face shield, whatever. And then when it was all over, he comes over and he's, his eyes are like pie plates and he's beat red. <laughs> And he goes, man, that was fucking awesome. You know? <laughs> yeah. Right? And that shot is in the movie. Right? It was an awesome movie. I see all the shell casings coming out. I was like, you're a madman. He said, yeah, but I wanted that shot, and it's in the movie. It's great. And uh, I, uh, that's the best part of what we do, you know? Damn, man. I agree. 50 cal <clears throat> in the car. And the stunt drivers. The stunt drivers. Oh, my God. It was awesome. And we put two Vulcan cannons on a truck that had the standard truck axle in it and i'm like each gun's like 350 pounds so yeah that's not gonna work so we're gonna do a test so yeah well you're not putting the real ones on there we'll put the deactivated ones because we spent ten thousand dollars a gun and brought up demilled 20 millimeter vulcans mike papik arranged it and we got the guns up here so we put those on the car and had the full weight batteries and everything in it he does the first side slide and the axles freaking snap so then i saw them bring in a uh, cube truck, like, a, like a, not a five ton, but a smaller, taking the axle out of it and shoehorning that into the truck. And that's what they used for the rest of the oh, show. Wow. Yeah. Heavy <laughs> dude, heavy, heavy dude. Wow, man. Yeah. We had cars go through fireballs and the ammunition in the feed tray blew up from the heat of the flames. Oh, wow. The, uh, the little Porsche with the two MG 42s was firing away and it was followed by the, the, uh, I can't remember the name of the truck, but he's got uh, four Browning 30 cals and the two Vulcan cannons and some RPG-7s on the roof. And he's banging away at it, and there's fireballs going off. And I say, why did that gun stop? You know? He said, hey, did the guy's gun stop? I said, yeah, it stopped. You go in there, and all the ammo's exploded because a fireball came up over the engine cowling. And oh, man. De detonated all the ammo. Yeah. How do you start something like this? Uh, somebody asks you, we got to put guns on cars. Yeah, actually, and it, it all started in Toronto, and Paul, the uh, production designer, called me up and said, hey, listen, uh, I want to show you some artwork, so, you know, what's it called? Death Race. Uh, prop, prop guy from BC was a prop guy, you know, he had his own guys, and he was dealing with the guys in Montreal, but they wanted me to do the cars, like, build all the cars and do the guns for it, so it's created some politics issues with being from Toronto and you know, Montreal guys, whatever. So we started with the ideas and then I picked the guns and then I redrew the cars with the guns I said would be the best ones. And then I took my whole crew. Hmm. I had uh, Peter Edmonds came. He's a great fabricator, great gun guy. Had him go first. And then I had Max McDonald was there. Uh, Dave Thompson, myself, Al Berkland came for a while. <coughs> I had uh, Andrew Campbell, uh, then Mike Papik and Bob Sika and Vince Flaherty came up from L.A. And it was a team effort to get all the guns on the cars. And the fabricators in Montreal who were um, race car fabricators, um, they are awesome. They say, hey, we need, a, we need to fabricate a feed chute that's going to work for this. Because you know, factory feed chute just isn't going to work. We just need that that fits with the, the design. So everybody worked together. It was a real choreography of, of action and at the end 
you know, I don't even remember if he even read the script. Cause it, <laughs> cause, no, seriously, because the prop guy was the one doing everything. So, right. you know, it's like, I just need these cars to all fire and they all work, <clears> right? That's <throat> all I need to know, that that's what I need. And that whatever guns, I'd get a list of whatever guns we needed. But basically, that was my job and my team's job. And then we ended up having uh, main unit, second unit. And then we have a local producer screaming at me one night because my armors from the United States are IATC 44. And they have to have 10 hours off. They have to, or they're going into meal penalty for the first eight. So, yeah, that created a little bit. Your guys are doing 16 hours with only nine hours off. You can't do that. I said, well, I need more people then. Because we were all doing 16-hour days every day. Goes back to that more people thing. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, where are they going to save the money? Think about it. Just spend more money, get more people, because otherwise, OT. This is yeah, what's happening. Yeah. Over time. And I was running between both units. And, you know, a lot of times, oh, where's Charlie? Well, I think he's on his second hour of sleep right now. He's, he's at the hotel sleeping. Well, he should be here. Well, you know, can't be everywhere. So I had leads like Mike Papik or, uh, or um, Vince or um, Al was there in a few days. And then I had the guys from Montreal take the lead on certain things. And uh, it was, you know, we had some issues a little bit, but you know, it was all personality stuff, not the job. Right. Everybody knows how to do the job. And there was uh, certain things where guys was, well, this is how I do it. And, you know, guns weren't working. And I said, well, that's not how I do it. That's why it doesn't work. You need to do it this way. And then it'll work every time. So it's a learning curve for some, learning curve for me, working with different guys from different places. But, you know, when you talk about technical abilities, that was it. That was a big one. Man, that sounds like a riot. It was. Would I do it again? In a heartbeat. (laughs) (laughs) Fucking A, man. But I know a lot more than I did then. So, you know, it comes yeah. with age. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like Randy. He doesn't know anything, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Not a thing. <laughs> yeah. That's, I don't, man, I, that's I, cool. Yeah, I don't know much, but I don't know anything. Yeah. Charlie, can we, uh, can we ask you to sign our table somewhere, wherever no, you want? No way. Please? Come on. Sure. Fucking do this. And obviously, yes, sir. <laughs> looking at the table you can draw a little picture if you want that's up to you yeah and it doesn't it also doesn't have to be right there everyone's sort of going yeah, there you, but right there or this one anywhere hmm. right now right now can i think about it yeah fuck stop thinking what's Just, with people no. thinking about what to write eh yeah 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 You're not the first one well to say you know that. they're motivated by <clears throat> these things you know again all the spotify listeners are like, fuck i gotta go to youtube that's scratching Charlie signing his name. He's writing a book, actually, ladies and gentlemen. Charles Hollywood. (laughs) Right on, man. One of the guys, Ron Corello, he used to work with Richard way back in the early 80s. He's a good good friend of ours. We were on set one day, and he says, uh, I got the name for you. It's uh, Charlie Hollywood. Yeah. (laughs) So Charlie Hollywood stuck around for a long time. And then it, it may come back. And then it moved to like <laughs> uh, Charlie Guns. So, okay. So Charlie on, Guns, on, yeah, on, on cool. walkie for years, it's like Charlie Guns. Or I'd come from another show. I said, hey, like I really need to have some sleep. Can I just sleep in the truck? You guys wake oh, me up when you need me. Charlie sleep. So, yeah. No, no exactly. <laughs> they say, man, don't, don't, don't wake Charlie up. It's the last thing you want is Charlie pissed off, you know, because he has all the guns. And, you know, I'm a, I'm a nice guy. Like, I don't. I'm not Mr. Yeah, Grumpy. Yeah, we, we didn't mention that, but you are. Yeah, I'm, no, I, you know, I'm not Mr. Grumpy or whatever. I'm just, you know, laser focused on my job, right? So I'm asleep in the truck and I hear like, hey, Charles, it's uh, it's lunch. It's like, oh, I get up, go have lunch. When are you going to need me? Mm, you know, we're, we're not sure. So go back. So I go back to sleep. And then it's like, hey, Charlie, you're wrapped. Find out I've been sleeping for eight hours. <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> but when they want me and I'm in my truck around, I said, uh, uh, Charlie, uh, Charlie Guns, Channel 2, you know, so just it's easy that way. What's yeah. your name? Charlie Guns. 100%. It's Charlie yeah. eight hours now. What's that? It's Charlie eight hours now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, like there's a few stunt guys in their careers that have been paid to sleep. Oh, oh gosh. man. All the time. I love yeah, those just days. Just hurry up and wait. <laughs> yeah. All the time. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, at, at lunch, my stunt pads are now out of the truck somewhere in the studio, 
and somebody's laying on him sleeping. Right? Well, I've heard, totally. <clears throat> I've heard it, I've heard it where you see the sound guy sitting there at his monitor, and he, he's got this quizzical look on his face, and he's looking around, and he lift, lifts his thing off his ear, and, and he can hear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's one of my guys sound asleep in the corner of the studio under a ferny pad trying to be quiet and sleep because <laughs> we're all tired. Of course. Because there's not enough of us. And we're, try- sure. and we're trying to do too many things. And yeah, and the odd stunt guy's got his feet up, sound asleep. Yeah. There's a famous picture of me taken by the, con- uh, her last name was Taylor, continuity in uh, Once a Thief. And it's me with a Beretta across my crotch with my hand on it, <laughs> finger outside the trigger guard, and I am sound asleep. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it says... Uh, there's Charlie Guns, cocked and locked. Uh, <laughs> right on, Even man. asleep, he's got good trigger control. <laughs> True. That's, That's cool. awesome. Yeah. So it's I funny. It. Yeah. And we've had a lot. Al Verklin and I had a lot of fun in the early days. Can only imagine. Yeah. Al's a great guy. Yeah. Resident Evil are awesome. Mila, all the, all the various actors we've worked with. It's just been so much fun. Yeah. If you want to know more, ladies and gentlemen, look up Charlie Taylor on the IMDb. You'll see what he's done. It's incredible. Or you go visit our website, moviearm, www.moviearms.com. That's You'll see better. our newest iteration of our uh, website that is still yet to be completed because, you know, we got other things to do like make movies. And um, so there's a lot of content still still to be done. And uh, watch out for Randy Butcher in a theater near you. Oh, yeah. And there you go. Oh, yeah. And you. And, and his number true. and his number number one son. Absolutely. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Charlie. Yeah. Um, it's not we, Andrew, it's number one. <clears throat> there you, uh-huh. Yeah. They I were like calling they were calling baby butcher on uh oh, on okay. M-O-K. M-O-W. oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm okay. Every, everybody was. Baby yeah, butcher. Yeah, yeah, baby butcher. Yeah. I have, I have a gun guy that works for me. It's Graham. We yeah. called him Graham the Kid Robertson. Okay. Because when he first started, he looks like a kid. But he looks not. like a kid now. Yeah, he He's, still does. Yeah, we call him Graham the Kid Robertson. <laughs> <laughs> so you're, you're a baby butcher, huh? Yeah, yeah. You know what? I'm okay. I'm okay with that. Yeah. <laughs> I like baby butcher. It goes, yeah. flows. Yeah. It's all right. Yeah. <laughs> Charlie, thanks for coming down. Much appreciated. I really appreciate it, Charlie. Yeah, man. We'll do it again. Yeah, miss. Oh, Absolutely. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Let's not, let's not wait like 30 years or something. Yeah. Yeah. Sh- you'll shave. For the next one, right? Well, it depends if I'm at the cottage. Or Copy that. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do it in the winter. <laughs> All right, bud. Uh, that's it. I guess that's it. Ladies yeah. and gentlemen, Charlie Taylor, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thanks. That's a wrap, D. Cut it. <laughs>